people are getting lost, so range is going to try and do it. What's your message for the day? Free Julian Assange. <laughs> Good afternoon everyone, thank you very much for coming. Today we start, of course, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we stand today, are the Turrbal and Jagara people. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and also to all emerging leaders. We acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians and recognise their cultures histories and diversity, their deep connection to the lands, the waters and the seas of beautiful Queensland and the Torres Strait. My name is Mia Armitage. I am a bit biased towards Queenslander. <laughs> I am a Queenslander. I live on the northern rivers now of New South Wales, also a very beautiful area. Uh, in case you're wondering what brings a Byron Bay journo here today, it is my connection to Dr. John Jiggins, first and foremost, who has taken on a lot of the responsibility, if not all of the responsibility, of organising today's event. Could we please just put our hands together to thank him for that? <laughs> Dr. John Jiggins is part of a citizen journalism project we lead at Bay FM Community Radio Station in Byron Bay where I work. That project is called the Community Newsroom and any journalists are welcome to join us. So please just get in touch with Bay FM down in Byron Bay if you are interested or know anyone else who is. All levels of experience are welcome, whether you would like to, to be a mentor or whether you are an emerging journalist or a student. <coughs> I also work there in Byron Bay for a, an independent newspaper. Some of you may have heard of it. It's called the Byron Shire Echo. I think it's featured on media watch once or twice. <laughs> uh, and it also has an online daily news, um, EchoNet Daily. One of the other connections between the Northern Rivers and today's event is in fact Julian Assange himself, the star of the show, although he cannot be here. Julian Assange spent part of his childhood on the Northern Rivers and photographs of him as a young boy in his uh, public school class, you know, for the class photo, they have been published in the local newspapers on the Northern Rivers quite a few times now. He went to a very small school. We have several of them dotted around the hinterland. Uh, and so he's considered one of our own, if you like. Most people in the Northern Rivers are passionate supporters of the campaign to free Julian Assange. Um, and then the other connection is just my own role as a journalist. When I was studying journalism here in Brisbane at the Queensland University of Technology, I was following his story. It was pretty disappointing to me that uh, when I discovered that there were some journalists out there he went so far as to deny, deny his, uh, his title as a, as a journalist. Um, thankfully, I think we've turned a major corner in, in that sort of denialism. Our first session for today is uh, called Truth is a Lonely Warrior. We're going to examine the major threat to our democracy by the attack on free speech and whistleblowers, by powerful actors in politics, the, the security establishment, and sadly, the media. Our speakers for this morning are Professor AJ Brown. They are all on stage. Professor AJ Brown is sitting there in the centre. Uh, Greg Barnes, who, who is not physically present. Um, Terry O'Gorman is on stage. He is over here to my far right. And David McBride sitting right here, and he, you may recognise his name, <laughs> a very well-known whistleblower. Uh, Greg Barnes sends his apologies. He can't be here today, owing to some case commitments on Monday in Hobart, another beautiful city. Um, they prevent him from coming today, but he has sent a recording of his presentation. So our first speaker is to be Professor A.J. Brown. He's a professor of public policy and law in the School of Government and International Relations at Griffith University. 
is also a leader of the Centre for Governance and Public Policy's Integrity, Leadership and Public Trust Program. A 25-year veteran of developments in Australia's integrity system since 2010, Professor AJ Brown has been a board member of Transparency International Australia, the World Anti-Corruption Organisation, and in 2017 and again in 2020, he was elected to Transparency International's Global Board, where he's led the development of its current worldwide strategy called Holding Power to Account 2021 to 2030. His most recent work, written with Kieran Pender, Protecting Australia's Whistleblowers, The Federal Roadmap, was published in November 2022 by Griffith University Human Rights Law Centre. We'll welcome him to the stage shortly, but before we do, I would like to let everybody know that there's been a raffle being held today, and all the proceeds, of course, are going towards the campaign to free Julian Assange from Belmarsh Prison and bring him home. Tickets can be purchased at the front here. They're $2 each, or you can get six for $5. For $5, thank you. The first prize is fabulous. It's this book, which you may have seen out the front, The Trial of Julian Assange by Nils Meltzer. Um, he's the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. He has been to Australia. He's spoken to the Australian media before about what he calls torture. It's officially described as torture of Julian Assange and demanding his freedom. So that's the first prize. And the second prize, also a very fashionable second prize, is a T-shirt, a free Julian Assange T-shirt. If you don't win the raffle and you can afford to buy either the book or the t-shirt, in particular the t-shirt, get one. Please welcome to the stage Professor AJ Brown. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor, and a big thank you to John for the invitation to be part of uh, today's very, very important event, and a big congratulations to you for coming out on a Sunday for such an important event in such numbers, um, and make sure you buy all of those raffle tickets. That's, uh, that's all I can say. It's a great pleasure to be here, especially um, to be here with John Shipton for this afternoon's proceedings, because uh, I think your participation shows that you understand, but I think it's very, very important for uh, as much as possible of the wider community to really understand just how important historically this moment is, um, how important historically the treatment of Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks, the nature of the WikiLeaks story is, and just how important a moment we're at for, bring, for trying to bring about both the actions and the reforms that will mean that the kind of uh, mistreatment of truth tellers in our society um, that we're seeing, continuing to see at the moment, can be stopped and prevented in the way that the broader community, the wider public, um, certainly understand and appreciate should be the case. I was really reminded of the fact that this is the long-term significance of, of the Julian Assange campaign and the outcome of what happens in relation to Julian um, is, is so significant um, because it really is gonna define uh, what happens for decades, the same way that what happened with Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers in the 1970s defined for decades, uh, the way that we understand power, truth, the role of the media and the role of whistleblowing. Um, and so, and, and it's now such a protracted, drawn out case, um, Julian's treatment, that it really it has become multi-generational. I met, I've met Julian once in June 2011 when he was under house arrest at Ellingham Hall in Norfolk. And I can't believe that that was 12 years ago and he's effectively been incarcerated in one form or another ever since that time. That's almost half a generation. Um, my son, my own son, Eamon, who's here today, studying legal studies in the, in the New South Wales uh, school system, the front cover of his legal studies textbook is a picture of Julian being extracted from the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, on Friday, his class uh, was talking about Julian. Uh, and, and the, the wider implications of, of all of this case. So this is now a multi-generational um, uh, case in, in effect, um, and its significance can't be overstated. Um, there'll be plenty of discussion, I think, in the course of the afternoon about, about 
WikiLeaks, about Julian, about the significance of these cases, about press freedom and about secrecy and about the role of the media and journalism. Um, and so we'll be coming back to all of that. But this, uh, this first session, and it's a privilege to kick it off, is actually about, um, not about journalists, not about publishers and editors um, uh, like Julian. Uh, it's actually about the whistleblowers who are the origin of the information um, that WikiLeaks was always intended to maximise and to bring forward. Um, and obviously we're talking about not just simply um, the, the response in terms of the persecution of journalists um, uh, like and editors and publishers like Julian, um, but we're, we're also faced with the fact that very often, um, uh, even when we have decision makers and, and powerful people and powerful interests who realise that it's a, uh, a dangerous thing to persecute journalists and the media. Um, often they don't realise that, but, in, but very often they do realise that it's a dangerous thing politically to persecute uh, publishers and journalists and the media. They will still persecute the whistleblower. Um, and uh, and the, the nature of whistleblower protection uh, is an issue, and, and the importance of it is an issue in and of its own right, although it's so much woven up with the WikiLeaks story because WikiLeaks was, was the first revolutionary global platform for giving whistleblowers uh, an outlet uh, such as never existed before. Um, and so in this session, um, we really wanted to, to focus on whistleblower protection in particular. And, and, uh, and so I wanted to do that with reference less to Julian, but more to some of the existing prosecutions that we have underway in Australia today, including the one that's been brought against my esteemed fellow panel member, David McBride, but also uh, the Australian Tax Office whistleblower, Richard Boyle, who many of you will have heard of or met or, or been following as well. And, and, and other cases in the background, Witness K uh, from the Intelligence Services uh, and his lawyer Bernard Caleri, and, and I'm sure there'll be some reference to, to those cases as well. Um, I really wanted to say three things. Um, uh, one is that our whistleblower protection laws in Australia, federally and at a state level typically, but let's focus federally uh, for the moment, um, are broken or indeed were never good enough to start with rather than having been good and then broken. Um, uh, but the positive uh, message on this is that we know what to do about it. Um, we know how they should be fixed and remedied. Um, and there are uh, processes underway that may or may not, and we can talk about that, actually lead to the right types of fixes. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention very uh, briefly uh, in a moment is the way in which we do have evidence of the way in which some of our laws are working, uh, which we can learn from the prosecutions that are occurring, including David, some very perverse outcomes um, which actually confirm some of the things that are working about our law while reinforcing the fact that on the whole our laws aren't working enough and that their reform is such a priority. And then finally and thirdly, um, uh, just some thoughts on what we need to do about it. Uh, in terms of that, the, the first uh, thing I wanted to say, uh, the fact that we know our whistleblower laws are broken or weren't good enough to, uh, to begin with. Uh, but we do know what to do about it. Um, I wanted to let you know about uh, a little bit about uh, the report that Mia mentioned in the introduction, uh, which is a live uh, tracking, if you like, of the problems with our federal whistleblowing legislative protection landscape and, uh, and what needs to be done about it. And it's this report that's on the screen there for you now, the one that she introduced. Um, I won't go through it blow by blow. It does re certainly refer to David and it certainly refers to Richard Boyle and to other cases along the way. Um, but I want you to know that it's there and please do use it as a reference as many people are when you're, um, uh, when you're thinking and talking to other people about what it is that needs to be fixed um, in our whistleblower protection laws. Um, it's easy to say we've got to protect whistleblowers, we shouldn't be persecuting them, but exactly what needs to happen uh, is something that we know. We, we know what needs to happen. Um, and, the, and our report maps out um, very concrete steps, not just for the public sector whistleblowers, but for private sector whistleblowers and all those caught in the crossover between the public sector and the private sector. Um, there, there's a very clear uh, roadmap that we've laid out for, what, for really what needs to be happening. Um, and I won't go through all of the, the key points. They'll make sense to you for yourselves when you, when you have a read. Um, but just to emphasise, I guess, that there are sort of three 
big questions about our laws. One is, which is really the, the green bubbles in the middle of this presentation, um, are that many of the legal rules and principles that are, we've been relying on to uh, provide whistleblowers prote with protection when they do speak up about public interest wrongdoing within their agency or publicly. Um, we know uh, where they don't work and why they don't work and we know how to fix them in, in order in, even to catch up with world's current best practice in other jurisdictions in, in Europe. Um, there's been a tidal wave of legislative reform in the right direction happening around the world at the same time as we know that whistleblowers are certainly under pressure right around the world. Um, so there are basic legal things about the content of our rules, um, and I'll come back to an example of that in a minute. There's, there's questions about uh, when, our, when our rules apply, um, uh, and they're technical types of rules, and I'll come back to that as well in relation to uh, David's case. And then there's really basic questions about the enforcement machinery of our laws. So we have a, um, a long track record of having tried to find ways to get to make sure that when we create legal protections for whistleblowers, that actually they will be enforced. Up until now, we, we now know that, and we know this again from the, from the prosecutions that are happening at a federal level, um, that those enforcement mechanisms aren't strong enough um, and that we need new ones. And so, hence, um, something that many people, including, I'll just acknowledge Greg McMahon from the Queensland Whistleblowers Action Group, who's here today, has said for long a long time that we need a whistleblower protection authority, a dedicated uh, institution uh, to actually ensure these laws are enforced. Um, and over the years, he's been proven right. Um, we've tried everything else, um, and it, we've shown that, it, that, they, that they don't work. And at a state and federal level, we, we clearly need that. Well, why? Well, let's dive into a couple of these cases for understanding exactly why. Um, what I wanted to do in saying that, that in perverse ways, we can see that some of the strengths of our whistleblower protection laws in Australia, um, I'll just refer to Richard Boyle's case a little bit, and then also to David's case a little bit. Because one of the really interesting things about a good whistleblower protection law is that it, it should protect people if they blow the whistle internally within their agency. And our laws on paper theoretically try to do that, although they need strengthening. It should protect people, it should provide protections to people who blow the whistle about public interest wrongdoing if they go to a regulatory body, um, to the police, to the Crime and Corruption Commission, whatever, and largely our laws try and do that, although not well enough and they need improvement. And then they should also protect people if they go public, if they go to WikiLeaks, if they go to the media, if they self-publish in the internet. Um, because if, if they do that because of the fact that um, either they had no avenue to blow the whistle internally or to a regulator, or it wasn't safe to do so, or they've tried that, and it hasn't worked. And that's 99% of the case, what happens. Um, and what's really interesting about the prosecutions of some of our federal whistleblowers currently is that they actually show that some parts of those rules are actually working quite well. The primary test for going public if you're a federal government whistleblower, someone like David, um, uh, is the primary test is whether you believe on reasonable grounds that your prior public interest disclosure inside the system or to a regulator, to someone like the Inspector General of the ADF, um, the, uh, that, that, has, uh, that, that, that that was not um, dealt with appropriately, that it was not resolved appropriately. Um, if, you've got a reason, if you've got reasonable grounds to believe that, then you're entitled with a few other tricks and trips, you're entitled to receive protection if you go public, as someone like David did. Um, what's really interesting is that we now know from some of these prosecutions that there is good evidence that that, that particular test is helping protect quite a lot of whistleblowers who, if they do go public and their agency wants to prosecute them for going public, that the Australian Federal Police and the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions actually say to the agency, well, no, actually, I, su you su I suggest you don't do that because the test is is a reasonable one in and of itself, and that they'll be entitled to protection under the law. So we're not gonna take that prosecution, we're not gonna investigate that offence. How do we know that? Because we know that because they've said that, and the Australian Federal Police has actually said that. Uh, but we also know it from the prosecutions that are happening, because many of you will be aware that Richard Boyle, the Australian Taxation Office official 
who's been prosecuted for a, uh, as a result of his disclosures about uh, oppressive tax collection practices against small business um, over some years by the Australian Taxation Office, uh, recently lost um, his hearing to receive the protection of the whistleblower protection laws against the prosecution that he's still subject to in Adelaide. Um, but what's he been prosecuted with? We know that in fact he's being charged and prosecuted and pursued because he ended up going public and going to four corners and, and blowing the story open and then subsequently he's been vindicated. Um, but what's he actually been charged with? He's actually been charged not with going public because the fact is that he's got a reasonable belief that his original disclosures inside the system were not dealt with appropriately. In fact, it's more than a reasonable belief, it's a fact. Uh, that's been pretty well established. Um, so, uh, so they haven't charged him with going public. What they've done is they've charged him with technical offences to do with uh, recording information under the Tax Act that he shouldn't have recorded, uh, with secretly recording conversations he was having with colleagues that were part of the disciplinary action or other actions that were being taken against him within the ATO. Very small technical offences have been chosen to prosecute him that actually have nothing to do with him going public. So the failure of his hearing was actually to say, well, and this is a defect in the law, it's number five, um, if you want to look at our report, that uh, the preparatory acts to making the disclosure, which is what, which, which is what where those offen alleged offences were committed, that, that they're not covered by the act, that you can get protection for blowing the whistle, for actually making the disclosure or for going public potentially, um, but you can't get protection for any criminal offences you might have committed as part of what I would certainly assess and argue, the judge disagreed, but I would assess and argue as being reasonable actions taken in preparation for or as part of or as a prelude to taking that disclosure. That's what he's been charged with. Uh, the South Australian District Court has said um, agreeing with the submissions of the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions that uh, we should take a very, very narrow view of those protections and that they shouldn't apply to those preparatory acts. Um, that will now be appealed by Richard Boyle, which is a very good thing. Um, it's another campaign you can contribute to. Um, and um, and uh, I'm hopeful that other voices like the Human Rights Law Centre are certainly looking at joining that appeal because of the importance of that principle. Irrespective of that, we need to fix the law, but in order to make it clear that those reasonable preparatory acts are covered and included. But, um, and that, so that's quite doable, that needs to be done. Um, but uh, it would be good if the appeal outcome was better as well. But the underlying message of all of this is, is how clearly it demonstrates that in this case, this particular agency, the Australian Taxation Office, supported by the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, um, has basically uh, pursuing these particular offences effectively as a surrogate for the real uh, crime, which the law is actually sort of successfully protecting Richard Boyle from, which is having gone public. So there's a perverse outcome here, which actually points to the fact that there are parts of these laws that are working and other parts that aren't. Um, a sort of a confirmation of the same issue really comes from David's case in some ways because I was very glad to be asked to be an expert witness in, in, um, in David's, uh, part of David's defence. Um, and uh, my evidence, if it had been allowed, and we can hear more from others about why it wasn't allowed for national security reasons apparently, uh, was simply that um, in somebody in David's position, if he made a disclosure of wrongdoing, to an appropriate authority in the system, like the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force, um, and that wasn't dealt with appropriately, then he was entitled to protection for going public under the law. Um, and, uh, but um, the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions decided, using national security arguments, to basically decide that that type of evidence uh, was not going to be admissible in the case. Um, and so therefore, we don't get the opportunity to actually demonstrate that in fact, someone in David's position had actually raised, blown the whistle internally first, uh, and therefore should be entitled to those protections if in fact he, he went, um, uh, went further. Um, so those are just some examples of why we know that our laws aren't working, but also the fact that we know what needs to be fixed about them and the fact that we do have some bits of the law that are working. What do we need to do about it? Well, we need a stronger new political consensus around the importance of 
the issue. Um, it's really important that we do have a new federal government that has committed to start doing some of these reforms. And when you look at our report, you'll see there's a little bit of a checklist of how far they've got so far. Um, and we'll be updating that. Um, and it's not that far compared to what actually needs to be done. Um, but we have an opportunity, but it needs to be an opportunity that's a genuine political consensus. Um, we need to recognise that there are good people in all political parties who are actually very strongly supportive of getting this right. Um, our own Senator Paul Scar from the Liberal National Party in Queensland, for example, is a very strong supporter. No political party actually has a monopoly on getting this right. And so I really strongly urge you to, uh, to be mindful about both the moment that we're in, in terms of the importance of these issues, and the fact that we do know what needs to be done, um, and that all political parties, all political voices, can be and should be part of that solution. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, that's really fascinating that we've got that document to refer to now too. Um, our next speaker cannot be here today, as I said at the start, and that is Greg Barnes. He's got some case commitments down in Hobart tomorrow. So we have to applaud very loudly for him, according to our organiser, Dr John Jiggins, um, because he's sent us a recording of his speech. So let's welcome Greg Barnes, nice and loud. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Greg Barnes. I'm uh, an advisor to the Australian Assange campaign. I'm sorry I can't be with you this afternoon, but uh, getting up from Hobart and back in a day, which I now had to do, it's just too difficult. Um, firstly, can I acknowledge the uh, women and the people on whose land uh, I meet today in Tasmania, and I acknowledge uh, elders past and present. What I want to talk to you about today is uh, something I think is going to be touched on by Terry O'Gorman, but I want to talk more broadly about it. And that is the way in which uh, truth is getting harder to find uh, or even to expose in the Australian political setting, certainly since 9-11, um, where we've seen uh, the principle of open justice, uh, protection for whistleblowers uh, become even more perilous than it otherwise was in Australia, particularly in view of the fact that Australia, unlike most other jurisdictions, uh, does not have a Human Rights Act. So I'm just going to share a number of slides with you which deal with uh, these questions. Um, unfortunately, uh, technology won't allow me to join in the Q&A afterwards, but if you have any questions, um, feel free to send them through and uh, to email me. John Jiggins has got my email uh, and I'm very happy to answer them. So let me uh, now uh, just share my screen with you. Um, what we're going to be looking at is what I'm calling legislative threats to outing the truth. Um, and we'll work through each of these uh, to demonstrate the point. The first point is that it, it might amaze you, but since 9-11, the Australian Parliament has passed around 100 pieces of legislation, um, often under the guise of anti-terrorism laws. But uh, as is often the case, when you use particular techniques and principles in one context, that is in the context of the so-called war on terror, you then find those same concepts being translated more broadly. And we've certainly seen that in some of the cases like uh, that Terry's uh, touching on, such as Bernard Caleri, Witness J, David McBride, who's with you today, um, a number of others who are finding themselves entrapped in a legal framework and culture, which is uh, emanated really from uh, legislation passed in the wake of 9-11. The Assange case, of course, can be seen in the same category. Um, it's a case which exposed, as we know, war crimes on the part of the United States and its allies, which exposed the war on terror and uh, what is happening in the context of the war on terror. Um, if Assange were in Australia, he would find himself entrapped in these laws, some of these laws that I'm going to talk to you about shortly. And of course, we've seen in the context of the threat to the truth, uh, these notorious raids on journalists a number of years ago now. You'll remember the raids on the ABC, the raids on News Limited, uh, particularly a couple of journalists, I think. Uh, one of the journalists complaining, for example, that the AFP was sort of rifling through her personal you know, clothing drawers uh, as they were in her home in Canberra. The ABC had to spend almost a day with its lawyers combing through material with the AFP to work out what information was privileged and what's not. 
extraordinary that we are seeing this happening in Australia uh, and extraordinary that it might happen again. In other words, it wasn't a one-off. The National Security and Information Legislation, as I say, I think Terry Gorman's going to uh, raise that legislation in the context of Caleri and Witness J, because, of course, it, that le this legislation, which again was passed in the context of the war on terror, um, and I've had experience with this legislation in the so-called Melbourne terrorism trial that I was involved in for one of the accused back in 2006 to 2008. Um, this is legislation that was notoriously used in Caleri and Witness J uh, in the context of uh, seeking to shut out any scrutiny of the courts. The Attorney General's Department uh, rather blandly says that, uh, and I've got the quote there for you, that it provides a framework of how national security information is disclosed and protected in criminal and civil proceedings. It balances the need to protect national security information with the principle of open justice. And as I say, many would disagree. Certainly my experience has been uh, that the balance is well and truly tipped in favour of uh, protecting national security information. Of course, it begs the question, you know, what is national security information? And there's a temptation always on the part of security agencies such as ASIO, the AFP and others to put a label on, leg on material to say that's national security, therefore we have to use this particular legislation. It's a threat to democracy. I mean, if, you know, one of the features of the rule of law in democracy that our politicians like to talk about, and of course the phrase rule of law is often abused and misused by politicians. But they love to say to us, well, you know, what we're doing is we're protecting democracy, liberal democracy. Uh, we're protecting the rule of law, and that's why we have this legislation. But as I said, uh, it tips the balance towards serving the interests of the security state. So let me give you an illustration of how it works. Um, in the uh, case I was involved in back in 2006, there was uh, an application to effectively... Um, stop a particular witness's statement from being given to the defence. Um, that was a potentially quite important witness. Um, and the Commonwealth uh, turned up with its own lawyers in addition to the barrister's brief for the DPP uh, and said to the then the magistrate, because it was in committal proceedings, look, uh, this is National Security Act uh, information and proceedings Therefore, we don't have to show the defence what this material is so they can make their own assessment of um, whether or not national, it, it is in the interest of national security to keep it secret. But what we're going to do is we're going to give you an affidavit of all the material. So they give it to the magistrate to go and read uh, at his or her leisure. The magistrate then comes back on the bench, uh, I might say, looking rather white-faced, ashen-faced, saying, well, yes, this is definitely national security information. Uh, no, sorry to the defence, you can't have it. And uh, no, this person doesn't have to give evidence. Now, you know, if this sort of stuff happens in uh, other parts of the world that uh, don't subscribe theoretically to the rule of law, we say, we shrug our shoulders and say, yep, that's what happens. This is happening in Australia. This is happening regularly. Uh, and uh, some of you there today uh, may have come across this sort of ruse, this sort of practice. It's a dangerous practice because, as I say, you know, if you're acting for a, a, as counsel or as legal advisors to a person who's charged with um, offences which might be said to touch upon national security, you have no way of knowing uh, whether or not uh, you're having the wool pulled over your eyes, whether or not your client is being treated unfairly. So it, it's legislation which is anathema to uh, the way in which we should conduct court proceedings in Australia. The other aspect of it that um, I haven't mentioned there, but which I will mention, is the fact that there are, there are provisions in the Act that say, if you want to ask a particular type of question to a, to a witness, um, and we deem that it's a national security issue, that question has to go to the Attorney General, and the Attorney General has to say yes or no as to whether or not you can ask that question. So you can have in proceedings, although um, smart courts and smart judges get around it because it's unworkable, you know, you can ask a question of, you know, uh, witness, the witness in the witness box. Uh, the question has to be sent to Canberra. Uh, when you get the reply, you can ask the question. You can imagine doing that 
you know, if you had, say, 10 or 15 questions you wanted to ask a witness, every time you asked it, we had to go through this procedure. It would take you months to get through uh, in that process. But the fact that, you know, our politicians uh, and policymakers could dream up um, such scenarios and such unworkable legislation tells you something about the uh, way in which they're prepared to undermine the rule of law and open courts and, of course, uh, democracy. The inherent unfairness, I've already talked about, the fact that, you know, uh, you're not getting a fair trial. Now, we all know what Article 14 of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights says. Um, you're entitled to a fair and public hearing um, in relation to uh, any matters, but particularly in relation to criminal charges. It, there is real what we call inequality of arms in these cases. We've seen this in the Assange case, of course, you know, demonstrable examples of inequality in the way in which the defence, uh, Julian's London legal team is treated, and the way in which the United States lawyers are able to conduct proceedings. You know, we have stacked the odds against a fair hearing um, uh, so sharply uh, since 9-11, and it's continuing to happen. Um, and we see it uh, in cases that are currently before the courts, and we saw it, of course, uh, as Terry uh, Will has told you, uh, in relation to 9-11. And this legislation sits on the statute books year after year. As I say, it's been there since 2004, uh, can be used at any time by the Commonwealth uh, and is used by the Commonwealth. And there just seems to be no debate about uh, amongst legislators about saying, let's take stock of this legislation that's now almost 20 years old to see whether we really need it. Do we need it? You know, how offensive is it in terms of undermining uh, fundamental principles of democracy? As I've already said, uh, the, these certificates which have to be issued by the Attorney General, again, are political decisions. The Attorney General can say, uh, right, this is information. If it's disclosed, it'll prejudice national security. Um, if the witness discloses information, it'll prejudice national security. And I'm going to issue a certificate uh, saying that you can't ask those questions or that person doesn't cannot disclose that information. I've already touched on how it works. But think about it from this perspective. Firstly, the decision of the Attorney General is political. It's not legal. It's a political decision. Secondly, what does it mean to prejudice national security? Um, we all know how the term national security can be abused. The term prejudice national security is also a term that can be abused. Um, you know, in the Assange case, of course, the, uh, the enemies of, um, of Assange uh, and what he did say, this prejudice is national security. You have to stamp out this sort of behaviour. We know, of course, that he was doing us a great service by exposing what our governments get up to in theatres of war. Uh, but if you were to believe and listen to uh, those in the military, those in uh, the Attorney General's department, the Attorney uh, Generals themselves, uh, they will take a very different view. It's a political view. It's really saying, we don't want you to know um, and that's why we're going to say it prejudices national security. It, it, again, for that reason, very dangerous legislation. It's been condemned. Uh, I've just got a quote here from uh, Mark Ricks, who's done some writing around this area. Uh, I won't go through the whole quote, but you know, the eminent jurist panel of the um, ICJ, the International Com uh, Commission um, Jurists, which is a, an eminent body, uh, has noted just... Uh, how this legislation is so unfair that the needs of the accused, who, by the way, might end up going to jail for 20 years or more for some of these offences, particularly under anti-terrorism legislation, uh, is not able to really challenge the evidence that's being used against them. Let's have a look at another piece of legislation that does similar things, and this one is particularly egregious. In 2014, the then Abbott government, uh, might have been just the start of the Turnbull government, passed a piece of legislation called the National Security Legislation Amendment Act. Essentially, it said this. The Director General of ASIO, uh, and I think also ASIS, can deem a particular operation being carried out as what is called special intelligence operation. And in a special intelligence operation, ASIO agents can commit criminal offences and civil wrongs. The only things that will 
mean that they would get charged would be if they murdered someone or there was a manslaughter, they caused someone serious injury, such as, for example, uh, you know, broken jaw, broken eye socket. Uh, even those might mightn't be considered to be serious injury, depending on the criminal law. Sexual offences and significant loss or damage to property. In other words, they blow up your house or you know they strip bare your car, etc. But it does mean, for example, that they can falsely imprison you. Uh, it does mean they can commit assaults on you, so long as it's not serious injury. So they could, for example, slap you across the face on a few occasions to get you to talk. Uh, they could uh, uh, lock, isolate you in uh, in a room um, for a period of time. Uh, they can download material from your phone without a warrant. They can do all sorts of things, and they're immune from prosecution or from the person taking any civil action. Now, that's bad enough. Um, and, of course, it meant that the secret um, bugging of the East Timor Cabinet Room, which Bernard Cleary exposed, would have been covered by this law. In other words, there, there would have been immunity from prosecution. Mind you, I, as I understand it, there's, no one's ever been prosecuted over it. But uh, this would actually say to them, yep, tick, you can do it because it's a special operation. Worse than that is that reporting on the operations is a criminal offence. So, you know, I have uh, someone I know, uh, this is a fictitious example, who has been raided by ASIO, um, and this is based on, uh, let, let me base this on a case that was before the New South Wales Supreme Court a number of years ago. ASIO took this person from a train, took them into a park, made threats, went to their house, uh, essentially uh, intimidated uh, family members, um, raided, um, uh, well, not raided, but, uh, yeah, they did raid uh, the, the rooms in the house, you know, that didn't belong to this particular person. I think it was a share house. All of that could never be reported under these laws. So you could have, you know, ASIO acting really egregiously against a person um, and you can't report it. Again, for what purpose? Well, it's not, have a look at the legislation's name, national security. Again, uh, tipping the balance well and truly in favour of security agencies, which already, of course, are exempt from a lot of the um, transparency provisions that uh, should apply to uh, those sorts of agencies, given the work that they do. And then the next example is the foreign interference laws and freedom of speech. Now, the foreign, foreign interference laws are current because Bernard Caleri himself is acting for a person who's been charged under those laws. These were laws introduced in 2018 at the height of, mind you, uh, we are now at a new height, but at the height of, at the time, this view that China was spying on Australia, that there were you know, all these people who were uh, running around um, uh, you know, recruiting Australian agents. You might remember notoriously the false allegations uh, made against Shaket Mosselmane, who was a upper house Labor MP, um, you know, who got raided, who was on the front page, I think, of the Australian accused of being a Chinese spy. Completely false. Under this legislation, it creates an offence of what's called reckless foreign interference, and that's the charge that I think is being used in Bernard's case, and I won't comment on that case because it's before the courts. But what does it mean? It means that if a person uh, is seeking to influence an Australian political or government process or right or prejudice Australia's national security, they're committing an offence if they are a foreign person. Now. That is so broad that it would mean, for example, let's say uh, I'm from China and I'm the head of corporate affairs for a Chinese business and I come to Australia and I have a series of meetings with people to try and find out what's going on in Australia in terms of regulations, the market, etc. the sort of thing that corporate affairs people do every day. Or I come to Australia and to do some lobbying on behalf of my company. Is that influencing Australian government or governmental or political processes or rights? Is it prejudicing Australia's national security? Sarah Kendall from the University of Queensland made a very good point uh, in a paper she published, I think, late last year, early this year. You could have a journalist who publishes a story, let's say, in you know, uh, a European newspaper, foreign journalist, or in, for example, the South China Morning Post, uh, Japan Times, et cetera, 
uh, they can be accused of recklessly harming national security if they publish a story that reveals war crimes committed by members of the Australian Defence Forces. Julian Assange um, uh, and those who republished that material uh, uh, who are outside of Australia uh, could be charged under these laws. And you, f you face up to 20 years in prison. It also catches journalists who go into covert operations. Often, as we know, journalists will go undercover in order to expose wrongdoing. Um, uh, they and their sources uh, could find themselves equally uh, trapped by this legislation because it could be said that they were influencing a, an Australian political or governmental process or right or prejudicing security. Again, have a look at the terms and how broad they are. Uh, they capture uh, so much that is otherwise essential information, sorry, essential practices in Australia, which is journalists finding out and exposing the truth, publishers finding out and exposing the truth, whistleblowers finding out and exposing the truth. It, it, it dampens that considerably uh, through these laws. Let me give you the last slide, which is the fact that we don't have a Human Rights Act in Australia. Of course, you have one in Queensland, you have one in the ACT and one in uh, Victoria, but we don't have an enforceable national human rights charter. So these types of pieces of legislation um, are able to pass muster uh, and effectively be unchallenged because we don't have any constitutionally enforced rights, enforceable rights. So, for example, in Canada, some aspects of these anti-terror laws have been struck down by the Canadian Supreme Court because they're said to offend uh, charter rights, such as rights to freedom of speech, freedom of movement, etc. Human Rights Act and a human rights charter is not a panacea and it's not a cure-all, but what it would mean is that uh, Australians would be better protected or at least be able to challenge uh, the types of legislation which we're seeing uh, emerge uh, in the 9-11 uh, context. The 9-11 context, of course, is now in some ways been replaced by the scare over China. And let me make this prediction. AUKUS, um, the continued ramping up of hostile rhetoric about China, uh, the sort of fears over Russia and spyware, et cetera, this will mean inevitably we get more legislation and we get even tighter uh, legislation through amendments to the National Security Information Act. We also will see continued prosecutions of individuals. Whilst Mark Dreyfus rightly, as Attorney General, um, ensured that the Caleri case ended, no guarantees that he'll do that again. And in fact, uh, on current indications, uh, it seems that that was a one-off. Um, and uh, there's a culture within security agencies and within the AFP uh, and state police forces for that matter, which essentially says, let's use this legislation uh, in order to shut down uh, dissent. We saw it actually in a very uh, relatively minor way here in Tasmania recently over the Easter weekend. Um, there'd been a cyber security scare in Tasmanian government. People's data had been compromised and some data had gone on to the dark net. The police commissioner and the head of the Department of Premier and Cabinet wrote a letter to the opposition parties and all the media saying, we want you to stop reporting on this matter and doing press conferences on this matter and embarrassing the government because every time you do it, it encourages those who've stolen the data. It was an extraordinary intervention by the police commissioner and by the government. There was no legislative basis for it. Um, fortunately, the Labor Party stuck to its guns on it. Uh, I did some media on it on behalf of the Australian Lawyers Alliance, um, and the threat went away. But it, it, got, it did scare people, uh, and it had a chilling effect. Certainly the Greens from memory said, oh, no, we're not going to do any more until we get a briefing. Uh, journalists, uh, uh, the ABC, for example, and uh, newspapers in Tasmania had to get legal advice on it. It was outrageous, completely outrageous, particularly outrageous in the context of the fact that the cyber security breach story had been running for a couple of weeks prior to that. But this just shows you the sort of mindset uh, that we're dealing with here and the grab for power and the reach for power and the overreach that you're getting on the part of security agencies 
and on the part of police forces because they can, because we live in an environment where they can. So um, that is essentially uh, my presentation and uh, what I wanted to say to you today. Let me just stop sharing. Um, as I say, sorry, I can't take questions. Uh, the technology won't allow, but very happy if you want to come back to me uh, via email or phone uh, to ask any questions or clarify any points. Uh, and um, good luck this afternoon and thank you for listening. Thank you very much to Greg Barnes, who hopefully is joining us um, via cyberspace. I think it's live streaming. Um, I wanted to mention, I, I made the assumption, and a journalist should never make an assumption, um, that everybody would know who Greg Barnes was, because if you've been following Julian Assange's story for many years, um, he's been in the picture. And uh, the first slide had his title there, you know, he is an advisor to the campaign for Julian Assange's freedom. But just a, a couple of other things that uh, Greg Barnes has been up to lately. He is actually the spokesperson for the Prison Action Reform and Reform Group Incorporated, as well as the Australian Lawyers Alliance. He's got a book out too, so he's an author, and the book is called What's Wrong with the Liberal Party? <laughs> Selling the Australian Government. <laughs> so, yeah, what's wrong with the Liberal Party? Question. Selling the Australian Government. <laughs> I don't know if that's a rhetorical question. He's the co-author of An Australian Republic, so I think he's a passionate Republican. Uh, he mentioned there the Bill of Human Rights, and I just wanted to let people know that I, I know you've got one in Queensland. Congratulations. It's not 100% though, is it? <laughs> um, there's actually a campaign where I'm living right now in the Northern Rivers, a community grassroots led campaign to have a Bill of Rights. So if it's something that you're interested in and you'd like a stronger Bill of Rights, there's no, nothing to stop you from you know, and, uh, starting a campaign and I'm sure Greg Barnes could give you all the advice that you would need. Let's welcome our next speaker to the stage uh, in just a minute. His name is Terry O'Gorman, very well known here in Brisbane. Uh, he, he's done some tireless work over the years to, pre to protect civil liberties of Queenslanders and Australians more generally over the past four decades. He's the Vice President of the Queensland Council for Civil Liberties, the President of the Australian Council for Civil Liberties, believes that in addition to a commitment to the profession, lawyers have an obligation to ensure civil liberties for all Australians are protected. So he'll be speaking today about two high profile prosecutions in the national security arena. Those are the cases of Bernard Collery and David McBride. Please welcome Terry O'Gorman. Thank you. I, I won't be speaking <clears throat> in any detail about David McBride because I think he's best positioned to talk about his own case. In an article in the Law Society Journal in July 2022, Kieran Pender, a senior lawyer with the Human Rights Law Centre, observed three men are presently before Australian courts charged with revealing information about the inner workings of government agencies or the conduct of our armed forces. Such prosecutions, says Pender, say plenty about the lack of protections afforded to whistleblowers and what is the price for our democracy and why a change of government that occurred last year must signal a new approach for Australia's treatment of whistleblowers. Pender referred to the case of Bernard Collary, who is a distinguished Canberra lawyer and former ACT Attorney General. Together with his client, Witness K, Collary was charged in 2018 with secrecy offences. The backdrop to the case is Australia's espionage against Timor-Leste in the early 2000s, when Australian intelligence officers are alleged I don't know why we have to use the word alleged. <laughs> when Australian intelligence officers bugged 
the Timor Cabinet Office to gain an upper hand in energy negotiations with the newly independent nation. Witness K pleaded guilty and was given a suspended sentence. Kaleri was charged with a greater number of offences, mostly relating to disclosures to ABC journalists, and his case was only recently discontinued by Federal Attorney General Mark Dreyfus KC. Pender in the same Law Society article also referred to the cases of David McBride and Richard Boyle. During Mr McBride's time as an Australian defence lawyer, he twice served in Afghanistan. He raised concerns internally about Australian soldiers' conduct in, Af in, an, in Afghanistan before ultimately blowing the whistle to the ABC. The so-called ABC Afghan files reporting revealed multiple incidents of troops killing unarmed men and children. And Mr McBride's allegations were later vindicated by the war crimes uh, allegations made in the Brereton report. Uh, Mr McBride, to the extent he can talk about his own case while it is before the court, will hopefully give you a more in-depth analysis of what is happening to him. Then there is the case of Richard Boyle, who blew the whistle about misconduct within the Australian Taxation Office, internally at first, and then ultimately to the ABC. Boyle alleged that the ATO was misusing, was misusing its enforcement powers through unethical debt recovery practices. He has also been vindicated. Several inquiries, including one by the Senate, have confirmed his allegations. But Boyle has been charged in 2019, initially with an astonishing 66 counts, later downgraded to 24. That still seems pretty high. Pender notes that it is worth re reiterating that Collery, McBride and Boyle are on trial for telling the truth about government wrongdoing. They are on trial for telling the truth about government wrongdoing. No one really denies what they blew the whistle on, namely Australia's immoral espionage against Timor-Lest. Who in this country who has followed the Timor-Lest debate would have the slightest doubt that it occurred? The potential war crimes committed by the Special Forces in Afghanistan and misconduct at the tax office. All three whistleblowers have been vindicated in one way or another. There is a revised treaty following international legal proceedings in relation to Timor. The Brereton report appears to vindicate Mr McBride and there is now an ongoing high level criminal investigation into allegations of war crimes by Australian SAS personnel. There has been a Senate inquiry in relation to Boyle, yet all three have faced imprisonment for telling the truth. For those of you who have read the book by Brian Tui called Secret State, Brian Tui is a journalist uh, who has covered national security matters uh, since the early to mid 70s. I'm old enough to have lived through that era and we are now seeing in the 2000s plus or the 2020 plus a replay of what occurred in particularly the early 70s and the early 80s. Namely, under then conservative governments, a willingness to prosecute people for bringing out into the public government wrongdoing and using the mantle of national security to do so. You talk about the wheel turning. Uh, during the street march era in this state, I had a brother, I have a brother, but he was then the president of the police union. He was talking to a demonstrator who'd by that time achieved some reasonably high ranking in the um, public service. And uh, 
my brother said to said to him, uh, "How the wheel turns," uh, and this person said, "That's what wheels are there for." <laughs> a little over a week ago, the ACT Supreme Court released sentencing remarks in the case of Witness J, where those remarks have been kept secret for more than three years. In the case of Witness J, the Independent National Security Legislator, Legislation Monitor, uh, the current one being uh, Grant Nicholson SC, in June 22, released his report into the operation of the National Security Information Act as it applied in the Witness J matter. Donaldson notes that as to the publication of the sentencing remarks in Witness J, it is impossible to conceive that any judge would have openly published the whole, and I stress the whole of the sentencing remarks, observing it was plainly correct that disclosure of the confidential information that underlay the charges against Witness J could endanger the lives or safety of others. But Donaldson, in a recent report, went on to be critical about how much further then was necessary the secrecy in Witness J in fact went, and he has proposed a number of legislative reforms to prevent another Witness J. It is extraordinary that it has taken three years for the sentencing remarks uh, of Witness J in the ACT Supreme Court to be published. They've been published in a redacted form, in a redacted form with the agreement, although <clears throat> one wonders how ready the agreement was from uh, Witness J lawyers, but with the agreement of his lawyers and the prosecution. But the fact that it has taken three years for that to come out, and remember how it came about. There are a couple of journalists walking around the Canberra court building and they came upon uh, this case that said uh, no entry, no admission. They made inquiries uh, and they were blocked. What in fact happened was Witness J was sentenced to a term of imprisonment and whilst in jail there was an attempt to stop him from writing his memoir so he then brought a civil action in the ACT court and it was that civil action that he brought that brought to public attention the fact of the criminal charge in a closed court where the public had been denied any knowledge of it for a whole period of three years. Former New South Wales Justice uh, uh, Anthony Wheelie KC has stated that Witnesses J trial now, this is not an ageing civil libertarian saying this. This is an ex-Supreme Court judge. He said that Witnesses J's trial appeared to be, quote, <clears throat> a complete abandonment of open justice. And Justice Wheelie queried whether Australia is now a totalitarian state where people are prosecuted, convicted and shunted off to prison uh, without they or the public having any notion as to what happened. Well, Witness J knew what happened, but none of the public of Australia knew, and it took three years for the public to find out. Despite these observations, the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor has made three recommendations in his June 2022 report to the Federal <clears throat> Attorney General in order to prevent another witness J. The first one is where closed court orders are sought from any court under the National Security Information Act, the Attorney General must be required, required to make submissions to the court to explain why such orders are appropriate and should be made having regard to the object of the act and the deep and on the one hand and the deeply rooted common law traditions of open court on the other. The second recommendation is that the act be amended to express that where closed court orders are sought, the court 
has the power during argument as to whether there is to be a close court to appoint a contradictor, sometimes known as a special counsel or a special advocate, to make submissions to the court as to whether an order should be made. The next recommendation of the Monitor is that orders made under the NSI Act be publicly available. In preparing this, I came upon, uh, upon a somewhat Kafkaesque reference to the fact that in the UK, uh, in a particular sealed off section uh, of uh, the main law library, uh, there is a section called Judgments in Secret Cases. Wow. It's walled off. Uh, no indication as to how you get to it, but at least the fact that judgments in secret cases exist in the UK is a little better than here. The final recommendation that the Monitor make is that where closed, quarters are, closed court orders are sought from any court, the Attorney General be required to argue to the judge and the judge be required to give reasons for making an order. You wouldn't think that's a particularly radical proposal. But as I'll come to in a minute, no less a person than a former head of ASIO said in a review of ASIO and other legislation two years ago that too many people in the intelligence services just don't have an appreciation, some not at all, and many not a proper appreciation of the balance between properly protecting national security on the one hand and, on the other hand, properly protecting principles of open justice. In the Bernard Collari case, uh, Anthony Wheelie, uh, who's presided over several of Australia's recent terrorism trials prior to his uh, retirement, said in October 2019, quote, this could be one of the most secretive trials in Australian history. There was something like 17, one seven, interlocutory proceedings, that is, legal argument proceedings before Kalari was to go to trial prior to um, the Attorney General uh, uh, ordering that the case be dismissed. Almost all of them are the subject of non-publication and suppression orders. The National Security Act create special procedures by which national security information can be protected while at the same time being used as evidence in court. Let's look at the definition of national security in this Act. <clears throat> it is defined as any, any information relating to Australia's defence, maybe okay, security, whatever that means, International relations, bugging the Timor Embassy or Cabinet Room, or law enforcement interest. Now, look at the definition again. National security information in the Act is defined as any information relating to international relations, security, or law enforcement interests. Those of us who live through Queensland in the 70s and 80s saw what sort of interest law enforcement saw as being theirs, law enforcement interests are such a wide concept that one of the things that I want to see come out of the recently announced review of the NSI Act by Donaldson is a significantly cut down, culled definition of what is, for the purpose of the NSI Act, defined as security information. There are two circumstances in which the NSI procedures can be triggered. The first is when the parties know in advance they are likely to reveal national security information during the trial. In that case, the parties must notify the Attorney General of this, and if you don't, two years in prison. The second set of circumstances relates to when a witness is actually being questioned on the stand and an answer has the potential, the potential to reveal national security information. 
If the lawyer or the defendant knows this, and how many lawyers or defendants, particularly lawyers, are given information about national security, if the lawyer or defendant knows this could happen, could happen, he or she must stop the witness from answering and notifying the court. <clears throat> A failure to do this, two years in prison. In either of these circumstances, the Attorney-General can issue a non-disclosure certificate that prohibits the information from being revealed or allows it to be revealed in summary or redacted form. The court then holds a closed hearing in which the judge will determine whether and how the information may be used. In a closed hearing, <clears throat> not only are journalists and members of the public barred from attending, but so also are the jury. The judge may exclude the defendants, the defendants' lawyers, or a court official if revealing information to them would be likely to compromise national security. Now look at that phrase, likely, and look at the wide definition of national security, a very wide definition. The main problem with the Act is that it creates a situation in which national security information can be used in a courtroom without the defendant, the defendant's lawyers, the jury, the media or the general public knowing the details of that information. The Collery, McBride and Boyle cases have to be seen as part of a new, wider trend whereby evidence is being admitted into court and is available to one side namely the prosecution in criminal matters, but not to the defence, even though that evidence may be used against the defence. The circumstances in which this evidence is selectively ad admitted is much broader than the previous law that existed prior to the bringing in of the National Security Act in 2004. Now, the National Security Act, when it was brought in in 2004, was part of these 100 tranches of legislation has been referred to that has had the counter-terrorism label. But one of the cynical aspects of this is that at the time that the NSI Act was introduced, the Australian Law Reform Commission announced that it was about to publish a major report dealing with official secrets. So what happened? The independent Australian Law Reform Commission had been given a reference to look into Australia's secrecy laws, including as they affected national security. So what, had, what happened? The government went in first, brought in the National Security Act, and didn't allow the ALRC to publish its report and did not even consult them. It's no wonder we've got an act that is so problematic. <clears throat> The trend of increasing availability of secret evidence coincides with a dramatic increase in the use of civil proceedings that can result in severe penalties on people. Federally, control orders, which can in effect restrict you to your home, preventative detention orders and continuing detention orders, that is, keeping you in jail once you've done your full-time sentence for a terrorism offence, those orders are done in the civil jurisdiction. So I can have a client who's been convicted of terrorism, who's done, say, 15 years, and that person can then be kept in jail on the basis of a continuing detention order based on the standard of proof in civil matters, which is 51%. The standard of proof in criminal matters, you'll never get a barrister to tell you this because they're too cautious. The phrase is beyond reasonable doubt, but the standard of proof in criminal matters is generally seen to be 95% plus. So we now have a system where people are being kept in jail beyond their full time for terrorism offences for these so-called ongoing detention uh, orders based on evidence that has to be proved only to the balance of probabilities of 51%. In 2020, the
The former head of ASIO, Dennis Richardson, in carrying out a review of the legal framework of national intelligence, noted a tendency to over-classification of material. This is a former head of ASIO saying his own former body and other intelligence bodies had a tendency to over-classify and he has urged that that be remedied. One of the main uh, arguments that uh, we are putting forward uh, in the Civil Liberties Council is that in the current review that the Monitor, Monitor has announced of the entire National uh, Security Information Act is that the intelligence agencies be bound as a matter of law rather than just being expected to do the right thing to stop this over-classification. Time's against me. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Terry Gorman. I don't know about you all sitting in the audience, but the fire in my belly is well and truly stoked now, <laughs> hearing all those details about that NSI. Thank God there's a review happening. Um, I wonder if that they are seeking con public consultations. Well, often they do when they do a review. We'll, we'll have to find out. Okay, so that brings us to our final speaker for this session. Um, most of you here today probably consider whistleblowers to be heroes. So let's call him a hero. And if you're not sure um, about whether or not he's a hero, he's got the boots today to prove it. <laughs> I was looking at those before. They're definitely hero boots. <laughs> uh, this is David McBride about to take to the stage now. Um, his reputation probably does precede him. You will have heard of the Afghan files. We've heard of them several times this morning. Award-winning journalism work wouldn't have happened without David McBride, a former British Army major, an Australian Army lawyer. From 2014 to 2016, David McBride provided the Australian Broadcasting Corporation with the information about war crimes uh, committed by Australian soldiers in Afghanistan that was later broadcast on Four Corners and the show was called The Afghan Files. That was in 2017. But the case against Mr McBride has led to the highly publicised Australian Federal Police raid uh, a couple, not, not long after that, two years later on um, the ABC's Sydney headquarters. Very dramatic. And equally dramatic, no doubt, will be his upcoming trial in the ACT Supreme Court. That's due to start in November, where he's facing five charges, including theft, disclosing information in breach of the Crimes Act, and unlawfully giving classified information under the Defence Act. And I'm sure he'll let us know whether or not that's going to be a closed door trial. Do we have to stand outside that door just banging on it the whole way through? We'll find out. Welcome, David McBride. Thank you, Mia. And uh, these are my lucky boots. I got them uh, in a second-hand store and they fit exactly. So I took that as uh, my Cinderella moment. Uh, I'm still waiting for my princess to come and uh, marry me. but. The, uh, the boots, I haven't lost a case in them yet, except for the PID case, which we didn't technically lose. Hearing uh, the previous speakers, and I'm very grateful um, to, to Terry and to AJ and uh, to Greg, it's a depressing picture. I mean, a lot of the time, uh, as part of my self-preservation, I, I don't think about uh, the details. And it's occasionally when you hear um, it being spoken about, uh, the situation, that it, it, it sinks in. Uh, it is bad. The situation is dire in Australia. Um, and it will get worse. There is no adult supervision on these laws. And while the politicians and um, uh, and while uh, AJ kindly says, you know, there's some of them are pretty good people, but some of them, they pass these things and, and, and some dweeb would have come in and said, oh, we need to have a law which says 
in case there's very, very secret information that the jury can't hear it and the defence can't hear it. And they've gone, oh, yeah, OK, that sounds good. Can't have these uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, you know, hearing about it. And the irony is, and again, this, it says so much about our system, our enemies, our truly dangerous enemies, hate us and want to bomb us <laughs> and spend years going about their actions because they say, we pretend to follow the law, we pretend we love democracy and free speech, uh, but in actual fact, we are a sinister uh, group run by corporations who actually uh, put people in jail without the benefit of law and based on all sorts of uh, spurious, racist grounds. And in order to combat that, we've enacted laws which prove our enemies' exact points. We have become, whether we always were, we have become the people our enemies used to hate us for being. We have become the dystopian world where we put people who point out terrible murders, like Julian Assange, stripping down to the essential elements of Julian Assange's case. He pointed out that the US government murdered people and instead of there being any justice, the US government is going to murder him, and it gets worse. And the so-called uh, bright lights of our democracy, the New York Times, the Washington Post, etc., are going to cheer him, cheer the government on while Julian Assange dies. That's our world. And Anthony Albanese, born in a council flat, out there to fight, fight for the battler. He's cheering them on while they do it. It doesn't that make your skin crawl? It absolutely makes my skin crawl. And while I don't, I've got two teenage daughters uh, who will struggle without me. I'm not here to avoid going to jail. I'm here to get change. I'm here to kill this dragon. It's not good enough if they just drop the charges and slink away. You know, they've wasted 10 years of my life. They've ruined my career, a career I loved. Uh, they've done untold damage to my children's psychology. I'm not going to be satisfied if they just slink away into the bushes. I'm here to kill this monster. And that may mean going to trial. It may mean being jailed. Uh, That is often the way we get changed. That is often, I mean, distinguished as the speakers were uh, before. A.J. Brown you know, wrote um, more or less the Public Interest Disclosure Act. He's very modest. He doesn't say that, but I can recognise his work in it. Uh, and it was kind of ironic when he had a witness statement against my prosecution in that, even because he knew exactly how the act worked. But, of course, they didn't let it in, and that's likely is what's going to happen in my trial. I've got, we've got a good judge, I've got a good court. Um, I've got, and I always try to say this, the police have been very fair with me. I've got no problems with the AFP. But the dweebs from the ASIO and ACES will stop any evidence which helps me getting in under national security, as Terry said. And, and it's funny, that's obviously a bit of a sore point. So when you write to your local MP, say, I don't want secret trials in this country, because they don't like that. Um, and they keep saying about my case, and they'll probably write us a letter after this speech, it's not a secret trial. It's not a secret trial, but as Terry pointed out, <laughs> we're only going to close the court 
in any relation, any, when any matter comes up, uh, which is to do with uh, security. <laughs> now, this is a case about what went on in Afghanistan during a war. Now, do you reckon how much, even the, where the toilets were on the base, is what they call security? It is pathetic. And you, you, there is no more pathetic group of people than those so-called lawyers for the Attorney Generals. And for those of you who don't realise, there is me and my team in, the, in, a, in a courtroom about as big as this room. There is the Commonwealth Director of probably, probably where, the, where the speakers are. And over there, and there's six of them, is a whole other group of lawyers from the Attorney General's Department. And guess who they represent? Our international partners. Isn't that sickening? Isn't that absolutely sickening? And, and, and my, uh, my lawyers said, don't mention, don't mention the international partners, I'll put you in jail. <laughs> it, it's the Americans. The Americans are running my case. Isn't that disgusting? Isn't that disgusting? My grandfather and most people here, grandfather or father or great-grandfather, fought in the First World War. Uh, he came back relatively unscathed. Uh, mentally and physically, he had a piece of shrapnel in him, but he never gave up on Australia. He was a, a suburban, small businessman, had a corner block, liked to mow his lawn with a push mower and had a rose garden. Um, and uh, his uh, eldest, he had the terrible job of having to send his eldest son to the Second World War, which must have been uh, terrible for his wife. And um, she had mental health issues, I think partly as a result of that. Uh, her her fiancé went off to the First War and her first her eldest son went to the Second World War and I think that maybe sent her over the edge. My father was too young. Now, you know the story of my father. He became a world-renowned person. He got a scholarship to go to Sydney University. That wouldn't have happened in America. We're becoming more and more American. He worked in a public hospital and he was so proud of that. Uh, he could have gone and worked in America after he got famous from thalidomide, but he chose not to. And I thought it was quite strange when I was growing up. I thought, wouldn't it be great? It'd be nice to be living in Boston, him teaching at Harvard. He didn't want that. He, he said to me, he knew, he knew about America and Australia and he knew Australia was better. He wanted his kids to be Australian. I went to good schools, I went to Oxford University, I went to Sandhurst, I was a soldier on the streets of Northern Ireland. My, my enemies liked to paint me as some sort of bookish person who couldn't handle a bit of blood. I saw blood. I went out, some of our people got killed in Northern Ireland. I went out to Africa after that and I worked as a security consultant in the diamond business. I've seen blood. I was in Rwanda in 94. I've seen blood. but. What I saw in the Australian military, and it wasn't the war crimes, that's part of it, was a complete politicisation of our military, where we didn't care about the truth. We made heroes of people that weren't heroes, knowing that, and we made villains of people that weren't villains. And it was actually the scapegoating of soldiers, putting good soldiers in jail because it would help the ministers get a bump in the poll. That just disgusted me. And that's what it's like. All of the shenanigans on now, it's not about China. It's about trying to make them look more popular. It's, the submarines are a way of getting us into the US gang. It's a protection racket. And once we say we want the subs, we are tied. <laughs> we are tied to the Americans forever, yeah. Uh, what I want to do, uh, I want to thank you for being here. It, it, we are the 300 Spartans. We are a minority. I mean, this is quite a big room and there's a couple hundred people here, but we are a minority. But it's, it, it's those minorities, it's those tough, dogged minorities that believe in principles that win, that win. And even if we don't win, even if I die in jail, uh, even if people come after me and they die in jail, uh, Boyle and Assange, we all die in jail. We will still win. We will still win because there are some things that are more important in life than just going along with the government, being fat, dumb and happy. 
it is much better to stand up for what is right. And uh, I want to thank you because it's, it's just like a football team and while I'm the one that has to go to jail, I, I don't do it alone. I, I would be dead without the supporters. I would be dead without you people in your room and you are part of this. By coming here, by staying interested in the case, by saying hello, you are every bit as much a part of this revolution of truth uh, as I am. Uh, and I want to. I want to thank you. I can't do it without you. Uh, and you can be very proud. If you do nothing else, you can be very proud of this moment in history where you stood up to be counted uh, for what is right. Thank you very much, uh, David McBride. That concludes the speeches for their first session. And we now have some time, very limited time, for questions from the audience. I think we have two volunteers with wireless microphones. Both of you are over here. Uh, so, we have a hand up right down the front here. I don't know if... They're just grabbing the microphones, I think. Lovely. I see. Well, perhaps the first question could come from the gentleman up the back there. I think he wanted to ask a question. Is that right, sir? No? Okay, down here. <laughs> no, no, no. Because it's being recorded, please do wait for the microphone to come to you. Testing. Okay. Um, you can say your name if you'd like. That makes it friendly. But you don't have to. You can stay anonymous. <laughs> My name is James Victor Grouch. It's a very unusual name, <clears throat> so I'm proud of it. I'm representing the Citizens' Party, <clears throat> and I'm nervous, sorry. Um, my question is, where, where is the where's the consideration of constitutional law? Where is the discussion on administrative law? <clears throat> and I once read a book... Um, it was called The, Sky, the Spy Catcher Case. It was written by Malcolm Turnbull. I, I've heard the name before. Uh, he defended a, a book writer and he essentially gave defence against the Crown and succeeded in the Supreme Court. Can we get involved here? Could he help here to defend Australian citizens as well? That is a rhetorical question. Is, am I off the point here? The Constitution. And, and we're part of the Crown. I mean, we've got a new king. Can you help us? Can somebody look into what's happening in Australia? How come we got it so wrong? I think uh, Greg Barnes would be well qualified to answer um, some of the points, to address some of those points that you have raised. But we have um, our speakers with some mics here on the... St on the can you, you've got your mic there. Yeah, and I think that our I'm professor happy is I'm, happy I'm happy to, to have a first go. I think, I think Greg Barnes um, did explain some of the problem when he, by emphasising the case for a Federal Human Rights Act. The trouble is that, you know, we do have, we've got a constitution that protects very few rights. Um, we do have an implied freedom of political communication that the High Court's recognised out of our constitution. That's actually quite critical. Um, I think if a lot of these sorts of cases ever made it to the High Court, the High Court might well cut through all of this legislative maze, all of this hundred pieces of legislation, all these defective bits of whistleblowing legislation, and actually rewrite the rules quite dramatically, um, depending on the balance of the court at the time. Um, but some High Courts at different times probably would, would do that. But it shouldn't take that, because we should have the fundamental principles if not set out in the Constitution, set out the preeminent pr principles set out in legislation. I think Terry hit, hit, hit the nail on the head when, he said, when, you, when you pointed out the former head of ASIO who said that there is too many people involved in controlling how all this works who don't understand the fundamental balance between whatever the interest in secrecy is and, and whatever the actual public interest is or the 
um, the, the interests of open justice. And that's really what's happening here. It, it's it's uh, in the case of the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions. Um, there's, there's these, all of these cases that we're hearing about raise this fundamental question about where does the public interest lie in all of this? So part of this legislative reform and strengthening that we're talking about has to reiterate the fundamental principles so that the public interest, um, open justice, uh, act, truth actually get to prevail to cut through all of that. Um, but it's a mixture of getting it right in these, in the reform, in, in doing away with some of these laws, in reforming these laws, uh, and then getting these principles constitutionally, if not constitutionally enshrined, at least enshrined in, in uh, more fundamental laws like Human Rights Act. So I think you're on the right track, and it, it emphasises some fundamental weakness with the way that our legal system works in the absence of having those sorts of constitutional or fundamental law protections for the, for the fundamental principles. Thank you very much, Professor Browning. Um, I've just been informed that given we had a slightly late start, that we don't have as much time for questions right now as we had planned. So we'll take one more question um, and then we'll take a break. So if you're going to be hanging around during the break, I'm sure that our speakers are friendly enough and passionate enough to take your uh, unsolicited questions. <laughs> Is that a, can I get a nod? Is that okay? For our speakers? Yeah? Yeah. So, we just need to make sure we've got the uh, microphone because it's being recorded. Beautiful. Hold your microphone up nice and close so that everybody can hear. Oh, hard. Maybe the volunteer could hold the microphone for you. Yes. That'd be lovely. So, 13 years ago, I, I want to say this. This is the, this is the background of the um, Australian government. Havoc, chaos, fear. And then we, we do left. Um, we, do, we give with the left and we take with the right. This is the government. Diversion, diversion, diversion. Divide and conquer. Controlled opposition. That's how they live. And you know what, we go around and round and round in circle supporting them with that, that kind of philosophy. So 13 years ago, I was um, with a group of girls who were doing no jab, no pay and, for the children. And um, I was doing vaccination. And I was coming out of um, an entertainment centre and going down the M1 and they detoured me. I'll try and do it quickly. They detoured me. They took me back on the M1. And there was a bitumen, um, one of those huge machines, travelling alongside of me. That's where it started. I was absolutely terrified. I did two runs. And my, my, my um, computer was hacked twice. So 13 years. Um, in, in the 13 years, there's been 24 friends of mine that have gone on the take because the powers that be who run the government, they decided to go to friends of mine who would upend information about what I was doing. 20, 23 people. Anyway, so um, it's been... It's been um, I've been totally and, totally and utterly upended. Um, I am now in a situation where they can't stop me, so they've decided to shovel radiation into my home. Let me tell you, you are all being radiated. You're being oxi oxidised and radiated because the, um, the uh, weather is interfered with. Can I ask what your question is? Uh, yeah. What's your question? I just want to share this. Uh, we're running short on time. Yeah. Uh, there'll be another question and answer section later. So, so okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, and um, thank you for coming along as a whistleblower. That does conclude our first session. The next session is due to start at 3 p.m. back here. Uh, there are some toilets that away and a cafe downstairs. And I'll see you back at 3.
our next speaker, like Greg Barnes, sadly can't be here. She's Kelly Tranter, a lawyer and activist. She stood as an independent candidate for the New South Wales Parliament, so down, down in, New, in New South Wales where I live, um, with an unsolicited endorsement of her candidature to her by the anti-corruption fighter John Hatton AO. Kelly Tranter regularly contributes political and social commentary to public affairs websites like the ABC's The Drum, Independent Australia, National Times and Online Opinion and has written for New Matilda as well as the Australia Institute. Kelly Tranter has um, been unable to get, get a flight from Newcastle on a Sunday, it turns out. So there you go. Um, and, but she has sent us a YouTube clip from the Belmarsh Tribunal, which we're going to watch now. I begin tonight by recognising the significance of this tribunal to Julian and his family. It is also very timely as we have reached a critical point in history for press freedom and for all human rights intertwined with it. Julian once said, quote, I understood this a few years ago, and my view became that we should understand that Australia is a part of the US. It is part of this English-speaking Christian empire, the centre of gravity of which is the United States, the second centre of which is the UK, and Australia is a suburb in that arrangement, and therefore we shouldn't go. It's completely hopeless. It's completely lost. We can't control the big regulatory structure which we're involved in, in terms of strategic alliances and mass surveillance and so on. No, we just have to understand that our capital is Washington. The capital of Australia is DC. That's the reality. So when we're engaging in campaigns, just engage directly with DC, because that's where the decisions are made. And that's what I do, and that's what WikiLeaks does. We engage directly with DC, we engage directly with Washington, and that's what Australians should do." Close quotes. That is to say, our relationship with the United States has long ceased to be an alliance as opposed to an amalgamation with an inferior status. Julian's proposition is validated by the freedom of information documents I've obtained and examined over almost a decade. Unfortunately, our intelligence agencies, whose records would be of great interest, are exempt from the FOI legislation. When I started preparing for tonight, I ended up with a story too long to tell here. It will be published on Declassified Oz this evening and I invite you to read it there. It tells a story, not the whole story, of institutionalised prejudgment, perceived rather than actual risks, and complicity through silence. My inference from the records I've examined is that our government's real policy on Julian's persecution is complicit in activity in deferring to the US. Inaction is the policy. An example is Julian withdrawing his consent for the use and disclosure of his personal information on the 13th of June 2019. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has always been aware of the reasons. His lawyers wrote to the Australian High Commission on the 24th of October 2019, pointing out his general entitlement to confidentiality for medical information and explaining why he didn't want Belmarsh to disclose it. That letter is discussed on Julian's consular file. At no stage did Julian block or refuse consular assistance. In fact, during a visit by consular officers on the 1st of November 2019, after he withdrew his consent, Julian raised his concerns about false reports from DFAT in the media that he had rejected offers of consular visits. They told him the issue of consular visits was raised during Senate estimates, and the department responded that four offers of consular visits had been made and not been responded to, but the media reported that he had blocked consular visits. Four years later, in Senate estimates on the 16th of February this year, our foreign minister is perpetuating this mistruth by saying that Julian, quote, does not want consular representation at this stage from the Australian government, close quote. 
The record shows this is wrong. There's no impediment to consular officers visiting Julian in prison. They have done so after he withdrew consent for medical information, disclosure, and they've also contacted prison authorities about his health and well-being. The documents prove the misrepresentation, whether careless or deliberate. Individuals direct a state. For every reasonable request that has been disregarded, for chairs that have remained empty when they required the presence of active observers, for every international law finding ignored, for every record that remains uncorrected, for turning away when an Australian life has been threatened and for the silence that has descended in the face of injustice, I say to many former and current senior public servants and ministers across many departments that you may have no shame now, but history will hold you accountable. Dealing with Julian's case, his very life, through the prism of international policy considerations and strategic alliances, rather than objective considerations of truth, justice, and actual circumstances, is what the FOI documents suggest. And it's a continuing institutionalized mistake. A primary precept of good government is justice for its citizens. But because our government has ignored every injustice in his case, Injustice now threatens us all, with a precedent whereby the US can seek to capture by any means, incarcerate and extradite anyone, including journalists or publishers, of any nationality from most places in the world for disclosing shockingly reprehensible US secrets. By courageously publishing the truth, Julian terrified with the threat of personal responsibility and accountability those who had been operating beyond reach. He knew they'd come for him, we knew they'd come for him, and they did. It's not a hard story to understand. Julian is a moral innovator. He made moral gains which had an immense effect on human life. He did what lay in his power to make people less cruel to others and was rewarded with nothing but personal pain. Posterity will pay Julian the highest honour for putting into the world the things that we most value, truth, transparency, and justice. History will look back on Julian as a particularly important person and on his persecution, the details of which undoubtedly will be further filled out over time and preserved forever as an appalling politico-legal abomination. Harking back to Julian's own observations about the real international hierarchy, the way forward is in Washington, not Canberra. Mr Albanese goes to Washington, could and should be the story of an Australian Prime Minister quietly but resolutely standing up for truth and fairness and the rights of a citizen and securing his release, the release of a person who far from being a criminal has put his life on the line for those same values for the benefit of people the world over. Thank you very much. So uh, Kelly Trander is obviously a journalist and this session is all about journalists' uh, role. Lawyer. Sorry? She's a lawyer. Oh yes, sorry, but um, has also worked, had her work published I should, that, that is true. She is a lawyer um, who has worked extensively with journalists, I should say. Um, as I was saying earlier, she's had her uh, collab contributed to the likes of ABC's The Drum, Independent Australia, National Times and Online Opinion, and has also written for New Matilda and the Australia Institute, um, which in, in the opinion of some would make her a journalist. And I guess the segue here is our next speaker, Dr. John Jiggins, calls himself a citizen journalist. So a citizen journalist and an historian. So his PhD is called Marijuana Australiana, Cannabis Use, Popular Culture and the Americanization of Drugs Policy in Australia. It's a history of cannabis prohibition in Australia and just another fabulous connection between Queensland and the Northern Rivers. 
He's a self-described minor god of cannabis. Not that we have any cults on the Northern Rivers. He's published several books on the history of the genus, including Sir Joseph Banks and the Question of Hemp, The Killer Cop and the Murder of Daniel McKay, and also co-authored with Jack Herrer, the Australian version of The Emperor Wears No Clothes. As a citizen journalist, he's the founding editor of the Cane Toad Times, which sadly is no longer in publication. So if you um, are a lucky holder of a vintage copy of the Cane Toad Times, I hope you've got it framed on the wall. The graphics are gorgeous, if nothing else. And the, the, also the West Ender, the founding editor of the West Ender. He's currently my colleague, uh, working in the community newsroom at Bay FM community radio in Byron Bay, also a contributor to national community radio service, The Wire, and also, uh, you haven't written it here, but Independent Australia and Pearls and Irritations. Please welcome Dr John Jiggins, who has been covering the persecution of Julian Assange since it started. <laughs> no, well, I know what I'll do to them if they go over time. Speak in the mic too, John. Okay. Um, a Revolution in Journalism, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks by Dr John Jiggins. According to Dr Sulet Dreyfus, Julian Assange was the most original voice in 21st century journalism. She justified her claim by referencing the invention of the anonymous digital Dropbox that WikiLeaks and Assange pioneered, which allowed whistleblowers to transfer information to the public while preserving their anonymity. This invention was widely imitated by copycats like the New York Times and the ABC, who never defended Assange or his journalism, and treat his outrageous persecutions as a normal outcome of a justice system. <coughs> the Walkley Award to WikiLeaks in 2011 for outstanding <coughs> contributions to journalism cited the invention of the digital Dropbox. The judges said, this innovation could just as easily have been developed by any of the world's major publishers, but it wasn't. Yet so many eagerly took advantage of the secret cables to create more scoops in a year than most journalists could imagine in a lifetime. As well as the digital Dropbox, WikiLeaks pioneered analysing large data sets in a collaborative way with the massive Cablegate files, working with a global coalition that included 89 major publications including the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde and La Publica. Yet while this famous Australian journalist is being tortured to death, slowly crucified by the governments of the UK and the US, facing the ludicrously vengeful punishment of 175 years in prison, there is no outcry of support from our media for over a decade, zero support. Instead, he is subjected to ludicrous insults like the ridiculous claim that he is not really a journalist. Julian Assange has won 24 major awards for journalism and social activism, receiving glowing endorsements from the most powerful journalists in the world. Assange restored to journalism its noblest ideal, an ideal that has been increasingly perverted and debased by the corporate media in their quest for power. The idea of journalists as a fourth estate. In the 18th century, the English government was based on three estates, the clergy, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. The idea of journalists as a fourth estate serving as a public watchdog and informing the citizenry about their government emerged in the revolutionary era during the transition from monarchy to democracy 
when journalists like Tom Paine inspired the American Revolution, urging the 13 colonies to break away from the British Empire and govern themselves. The legacy of these courageous journalists was the First Amendment to the US Constitution, which guarantees the right to free speech and a free press, a guarantee that is under its greatest attack now with the persecution of Julian Assange, who is being brutally punished for the crime of journalism. The Walkley panel acknowledged this aspect of Assange's journalism too. They said, this year's winner has shown a courageous and controversial commitment to the finest tradition of journalism, justice through transparency. WikiLeaks supplied new technology to penetrate the inner workings of government to reveal an avalanche of inconvenient truths in a global publishing coup. Its revelations on how the war on terror was being waged to diplomatic bastardry, high-level horse trading and the interference in the domestic affairs of nations have had an undeniable effect. The corporate media avoid condemning Assange's persecution, partly through jealousy, but largely because of their anger at being revealed to be corrupt warmongers who are serially dishonest and massively compromised. In the centuries that separate us from Tom Paine and the American Revolution, journalism became dominated by giant corporations and family dynasties like Packers and the Murdochs. These press barons misused their media power to spin the news to become powerful political actors, boosters of their chosen politicians and policies. What matters for the corporate journalists they employ was not truth, but the narrative the corporate agenda demanded. The Murdoch press has become the most powerful political party in Australia, according to former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. Another former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, described them as a cancer eating the heart of Australian democracy. Murdoch's empire has a near monopoly in Queensland, controlling not just the Courier Mail, but every newspaper in regional Queensland. The First World War further deformed corporate journalism as the state harvested the propaganda power of the corporate media to convince young men everywhere to slaughter each other on an industrial scale. Journalists of this era were christened the stenographers of power who published the dictates of the war boosters unquestioningly. The Second World War intensified this marriage between the deep state and the corporate media. When Britain's ally against Hitler's Germany was Stalin's Soviet Union, the British press lauded Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin and christened him Uncle Joe. Alarmed by the valorisation of Stalin, one conservative confronted Churchill. Don't worry, Churchill replied, we can turn it on and off like a tap. And they did. Uncle Joe became the new Hitler, then Chairman Mao, Uncle Ho, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Colonel Gaddafi, Syria's Bashar al-Assad, as the endless wars rolled on. In 2003, every newspaper in Australia campaigned for the Iraq War, a crime of military aggression against a sovereign nation, which constitutes the ultimate war crime. 
Their embedded journalists reported the war from the perspective of the US military until WikiLeaks revealed their lies with the collateral murder video and the Iraq war logs. These revelations made WikiLeaks famous and made Assange the target of the Five Eyes. Over the past year, our media has recklessly campaigned for a war with China. According to the China Hawks, 2027 is the year penciled in for this war. This flock of vultures circle our planet, raucously squawking Orwell's famous paradox that war is peace. In 2006, Julian Assange unleashed his revolution in journalism by adopting the fourth estate ideal of journalism that the mainstream media had abandoned. Instead of causing wars, WikiLeaks stopped them. The persecution of Julian Assange is intended as a message from the Five Eyes to make journalists afraid to reveal war crimes. Because he exposed their crimes, Assange has been treated as the most dangerous man in the world. Thank you. <laughs> These lights are blinding me um, bright. <laughs> anyway, in conclusion, I want to thank all the speakers who have come to support Julian Assange and all those who have helped organise this event and all of you who have come here too to contribute at this perilous time in history when our big brothers are preparing us for another massive war. Thank you very much, Dr. John Jiggins. Dr. John Jiggins, incidentally, has organised quite a few forums similar to this in, um, over the past few years, but rarely actually gets up and speaks himself. So hopefully we'll get to hear from you more often. And our next speaker is Michael West. Journalist Michael West spent two decades working as a journalist, a stockbroker, an editor, and a finance commentator before striking out on his own in July 2016. And I, I hope that everybody here has had an opportunity to check out the amazing work at michaelwest.com. One of the few uh, dedicated investigative journalism outlets left in Australia. Um, after eight years as a commentator with The Australian and another eight years with the Sydney Morning Herald as a journalist and editor, he founded his website, Michael West Media. And the focus there, it is mostly investigative journalism, but it's also really focused on high public interest stories. He's a Walkley Award winner and an adjunct professor at the University of Sydney School of Social and Political Sciences. Please welcome Michael West. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, John. And uh, respects to the traditional uh, landholders. Um, what a privilege it is to be speaking on behalf of Julian Assange and, of course, our great hero here, David McBride, if David's still here, I mean, these guys being persecuted for doing the right thing, for going beyond the call of duty. As a journalist, one of the great things is you get the privilege of being able to come into people's lives at the moment of their greatest triumph and tragedy and turmoil. And, uh, and so it is that over the years I've got to know many whistleblowers, some who've never been, um, whose identities have never been made known, uh, who have gone beyond the call of duty um, to bring some kind of public good via the media by exposing things. 
Um, they put often their lives and families at risk. Julian, of course, is the most famous of all of these, and he is a symbol of something which is, as our excellent legal speakers earlier, um, and John pointed out, uh, it's become something different now. It's become a real worry. And the reason that it is that, if I just make a few observations about the way the media is going, it's probably my only uh, area of real expertise here. Being a journalist, you just cadge other people's intellectual property and reproduce it, you know, good typing skills. Um, but what we've got here is a changing business model, the incursion of the internet in the early 2000s. Completely changed the business model. When I was at Fairfax last, between 2008 and 2016, before uh, being ostracised for the crime of journalism uh, and having to go out on my own and become a small businessman and being the world's worst small businessman, I, uh, I got to see this firsthand. Uh, I got to see all the people that were made redundant over the years, five redundancy programs in, in eight years, as I recall it. Uh, What's happened here, and this goes to the treatment of Julian Assange and David indeed and others in the media and the, the increasing um, proximity of the media to the political classes. They've always been close because, of course, the media are their messengers. Um, and in Australia particularly, we have a media duopoly. We have this high concentration of effectively the Fairfax, now the Nine Media Empire, Nine Entertainment, and the Murdoch Press, particularly in Queensland and South Australia, this concentration is really, really bad, um, as John just pointed out. So there's a grip by a couple of very large corporations on the media. And yes, there is social media, there are independent media outlets like myself, but the way that this works is, and it, this particularly got worse under the, under the Scott Morrison regime because previously, before Morrison came along, the Prime Minister's office and the Treasurer's office, they would simply farm out stories, drop their scoops or their leaks or their plants uh, or their drops is the usual terminology to their favourite journalists who they could rely on to transmit the message properly and bury the but the bad side of this policy might be, said somebody right at the very bottom of the story. So the headline, of it's the placement of the stories and the way the headlines and photos are used, which are also very powerful. As we know, it fell apart at the last election because despite the major, mainstream media and Seven as well barracking uh, for the coalition, um, there was a movement away from the major parties and despite this avid barracking for the Morrison government, uh, they got turfed out, which was a great thing. So it's heading in the right direction, and I do have ho hopes for it. But as the lawyers today have pointed out, there's a real problem with the apparatus of state and the way that the laws are being both le legislated for a start and then executed. The way that it works is the media, under Morrison, he began, instead of dropping to either News or Fairfax, so the other one the next day would come and challenge and go to Labor and say, well, what do you, what do you think about this? So there'd be a, there was a war between those two. They were rivals. That all stopped under Morrison. He just got them all in, about the 10 people in the press club in, in Canberra. He said, well, I'm going to just give, drop it to you, all of you, every night. And they still put their exclusive tags on it. But what it meant was that the next day, at 4 o'clock in the morning, when the news, TV and radio people got up, the producers got up, they just look at the front pages and then their news agenda would go from there. You know, gas fracking, good. Julian Assange, not good. Whatever the agenda was. And so under this scheme, the, the, the mainstream media became ever closer to government at a time and you might have noticed lately that their paywalls are now getting tighter, the Fairfax paywalls. You can't even get around them virtually at all except to see a first paragraph or so. They're getting tighter. And so this public interest journalism, public interest journalism has been quarantined just for their paying subscribers, but the ABC and SBS and 2GB and all the radio stations, they pick it up the next day and they run with whatever that agenda is. So this little funnel, the Prime Minister's office, and Albo's doing it increasingly now, is disseminating a nicely crafted message for the media mates, a little cabal, and they are getting picked up 
by the rest of the media, and by the time you've got more critical people or experts able to, to, to analyse it properly and, and look at it objectively, the media cycle has moved on. So that's how they're doing it. Now, my hopes are uh, that there's going to be... Now there is citizen journalism and it's becoming more mature. There's more independent media outlets and so on that this will continue to challenge the mainstream media because they don't have a business model. They're getting propped up by government subsidies via the Google News, via the digital media bargaining code, etc. They're not really viable without their scoops from government and without their public subsidies via this digital media bargaining code transfer of money from Google, from Google and Facebook over to News Corp and Fairfax. They're propped up by government despite all their free speech rhetoric. That's all hypocrisy. They're on a gravy train. And of course, as their revenues have been under challenge, big corporations have got bigger. And there's a falling confidence, public confidence, in all large institutions because of the way the media and government have got closer together. Social media is shaking all that up, so we can only hope the social independent media will continue to rise. And for my part, I think it has to. The internet's like the blob. If you hit it in one place, it bulges out in another. You can't really beat it. The only challenge really is this kind of shenanigans with lawyers and so on and, and the organs of government trying to shut people down. I get about three to five defamation threats every year. It's quite a simple thing. They threaten you. You look at it, you go, this is going to cost me, if it went to court, went all the way, half a million dollars, I lose my house. That's it. And that is the risk every time. That's what they're saying to you every time they come at you, whether it's a gas frac fracking company like Tambaran Resources, that threatened me twice in the past year or two, backed by a US Texan oil billionaire, threatening a small media operator in Australia. Defamation threats. People on Twitter or Facebook are being threatened to by lawyers. It's an easy one for a lawyer, a couple of thousand bucks for a corporate client to muzzle somebody. These are big threats. There needs to be defamation law reform, but I'm hopeful that in the end, because of the internet, people's voices will be heard. It's happened politically. We've seen it in elections recently in the past few years. People don't trust the mainstream anymore. It doesn't have the credibility it used to, and it's closer to government. So there is there's a lot of darkness going around, particularly with the, the persecution of McBride and Julian Assange and others, Richard Boyle and many others. But there's great hope there as well. Happy to take some questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Michael West. Um, I'll just say my name again since I'm about to join these two journalists on stage. I'm Mia Armitage. I'm a reporter down in Byron Bay, northern New South Wales, for an independent newspaper and online uh, publication called Echo Publications. You may know of the Byron Shire Echo. It has been around a while. I also work at Bay FM community radio station. Dr John Jiggins is one of my colleagues. He's part of that team. It's a team of journalists from uh, mostly around the Northern Rivers region, but also across the country. Um, and again, an invitation to anyone who is interested in community journalism, please reach out to Bay FM and they'll put you in touch with me. But please don't hit me up today because I'm already feeling quite overstimulated. Um, I'm going to get my David Spears or Barry Cassidy on now and, and sit down here. It is Sunday after all, so this can be our own little version of Insiders. Um, ask a couple of questions and that might get you thinking of a couple of questions that you may have, in particular for Michael West, since, since he's travelled a long way to be with us today. And uh, Michael West, before I sit down, I might put the first question to you, and that's about this idea of the drop. Um, in case you've forgotten, uh, the drop is uh, but more or less when a politician gives a tip-off, an exclusive tip-off to a journalist, or in the case, as he, uh, Michael West was saying, of Scott, former uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, 10 journalists got to be in that drop club. <laughs> drop club. There you go. <laughs> uh, so I remember asking, I got to interview Barry Cassidy, former host, founding host of Insiders at the Byron Writers Festival last year. 
I asked him, he spoke passionately against this idea of the drop, but I said, well, in 18 years, you know, as someone considered the political insider for journalism, uh, very much inside the Canberra press bubble, did you not receive a drop? He was adamant, absolutely not, and he would never wanted to receive a drop. He, he found the concept disgusting. Um, I also heard quite a lot of senior journalisms talk about the change in the journalism industry. You've mentioned quite a few changes, namely redundancies and the um, changes that the internet has brought with it in social media. So when it comes to practices like receiving a drop, Michael West, what, how do you think uh, journalists these days can, can produce outstanding work like your own without access to things like the drop? What's the new, what, what's the best and most effective, easiest, most noble way of getting around that? Thanks, Mia. The point, the point of the drop really is that it's a vanity thing because there's nothing uh, journalists like more to see their name, their byline on the front page of a newspaper. I and mean, it's a great, I can still remember my first front page of the, the Fin Review, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, it's a great thrill. You become important because you're the person that has got the scoop and so on. But of course, when you become a bit um, old and cynical, you look at it and go, well, that bloke's just been given the press release a day early. And there are literally, we know the, we know the names of them, Fin Review, Herald Age, The Australian, um, ABC. We know the people who get the drops. And often these days, the point of what Morrison did was he didn't give them to one journalist one journalist or two journalists exclusively. They're now giving them all to a bunch of journalists. It's all being produced around 12 o'clock at night to three o'clock in the morning. Well, that's when they press the button. And then the radio people get up in the morning and the TV people, and they then take the news agenda from there. So it's already been set. And then often, the worst, the last government was notorious, notoriously bad, corrupt and incompetent. This one's not in that league at all. Is trying to do a better job, but the system is persisting now, where they're just dropping the news, and then by the time the actual policy detail comes out, so you've got a chance to look at the thing properly and do journalism, which is trying to be objective, um, looking at the evidence, the message has already been sent. The PR has been done from government, and that's the problem. They've just got everybody wrapped around their little pinky, but thankfully on Twitter and other channels, there's a lot of good debate going on, which sometimes swings a bit too far in the other direction, but, but corrects the record. Okay, it sounds like you're advising a journalist to take advantage of Twitter, Musk's Well, Twitter. they do, but they're all muzzled now. See, this is yeah. the problem with institutionalisation, because yeah. 10 years ago on Twitter, the journalists used to be having fights all the time, um, you know, disagreeing with each other. And so these days, they're bound by social media policy. If they get into a Twitter a debate with somebody and it gets nasty or personal, they could be in breach of their social media policy. So that's all finished now. You never see anybody. They're all leaving Twitter, the mainstream journalists. Not all of them, but most of them are step. But some notable big profile ones from the ABC and so on have left. Yeah, okay. I want to talk now about your work as well, Michael West, because um, one of the other one of the threats that journalists are faced, faced by in this country in doing their work is defamation. You mentioned defamation. Do you know how many times you've been threatened with defamation in doing your work? And yeah. Well, it would be triple figures probably triple by figures. now. Uh, it's be quite a few. I, I, I do. I used to keep a file, but you know. Um, most of them are just letters from a lawyer. Yeah. It's usually the same lawyer bobs up all the time and, and it says, private and confidential, you must do this, take down the story, apologise in words of our proving, pay our costs of threatening you with this letter. And so I, I, I call them, I say, thank you very much, but let's discuss the actual facts of what your claim is here. And of course, they shy away because there's nothing a lawyer, they're, they're bold keyboard warriors with their little emails, but there's nothing they hate more than getting a phone call from one of their victims saying, well, let's, just, let's talk about it. How and many, they just, how right, many they times have they actually horror. followed up on the, on the threat? Well, I often, depending on the case, if there's something wrong or that I've been unfair, we just correct it immediately. And that's the good thing about online. 
you know, it's not like the, the, the fish wrapper which sticks around forever. You just, in order to, if, to show that, you know, you've been fair, um, but usually it's just, they don't, it's a freedom of speech thing, they don't want, they just try to muzzle you. Private and confidential, and as I point out to them, you're not allowed to send somebody a threat and say it's pri unsolicited threat, which this threat is, and say it's private and confidential. So I often just, just take a nice screenshot of it and put it straight on Twitter, private and confidential. <laughs> So does defamation scare you? I mean, you've been in the trade a couple of decades now. Um, it, does, it, does it scare you? Does it ever stop you from doing the work that you do? And I'm asking you that because I think it's important that any other journalists out there who may not be as experienced as you know whether or not they need to be as scared of defamation as perhaps they are. And, uh, yeah, should they be as oh, it's, that scared? Uh, well, you've got to have a risk appetite for it. I mean, there's, oh. there's people being sued. And money? I don't have any money, and I'm I'm doing I'm making a go of it. But you've got to be prepared. So if you look at some of the younger people, Jordan Shanks, for instance, right? He doesn't have any assets. Doesn't have any kids. So nothing to lose. Well, he hasn't is got anything. It, he that, hasn't got anything to yeah. lose, and that's why he goes hard. He can go very hard. It's, you've got to really watch out. If you've got one asset that they can come after, that's the purpose of it. The purpose the purpose of it is to scare you so that you take down the story and the story is no longer circulating in, in public. Well, I'm going to come back to the drop now because if that is scary and you need to be either someone with nothing to lose or someone with lots of money to be able to fight defamation, I could kind of understand why some journalists would be like, oh, I'll just take the drop. <laughs> I'm not going to get done for defamation if I'm just quoting exactly what the Prime Minister has told me. Mm. Um, so quite extreme. What do you think um, needs to be done to get these defamation laws improved so that journalists and whistleblowers are protected? And don't worry, John, we're going to come to you next. I'm dying to know whether you were ever threatened with defamation at the Cane Toad Times. Oh, we'll go to the Q&A after this then. Okay, yeah. Well, it's just they've got to change the laws or it's not thought. going to get any better. I mean, the defamation law... Seriously, Australia pumps out a lot of lawyers and, uh, the de you know, the no-win, no-fee crew as well. They're running around extorting people. So, you know, that's why I'm so thrilled to be here today, to hear the good lawyers talking. Uh, because um, it, there really is... The thing that I can threaten them with is because I've got a, a, an audience... I can threaten them back with the Streisand effect. The, the we, Streisand we're, we're, effect? The Streisand effect, where that... Barbara Streisand complained about a, a small publication that was critical of her in a regional thing and, and it became a global story when, after she complained about it. Because she complained, her complaint became the story. So the Streisand effect is, is they know that, oh, you know, like Angus Taylor threatened me a couple of years ago. I went, oh, thank you, Angus. Put it straight on Twitter. Private and confidential, Angus Taylor. And uh, I didn't hear from Angus again. So, um, so it was fighting, wonderful, you know. Okay, so it's kind of like fighting defamation yeah. by, by really ramping it up. Actually, well, yeah, but not everyone can do that. Not, not everyone can do that. So if you haven't got a large audience to threaten, and who wants to do that anyway? Yeah. Very few people, unlike myself, get a thrill out of it. So, <laughs> so the answer is they need to change the laws because it favours the big institutions. They have big balance sheets. They can afford compliance departments and lawyers to fight this stuff. The Ben Robert Smith case has cost $40 million. Yeah, and I wonder, maybe um, when John Chipton comes to the stage, might let us know an idea of how much that campaign is costing the fight for Julian Assange, so... Well, that'd be wonderful to hear from John mm. on that. I mean, there's a lot of goodwill for Julian. A lot of civil society groups giving money to people like David and Julian, probably never enough, but... So if Julian is... If, if the cause still, is important yeah. like that, yeah. then then you can raise money. That's another good thing that about... Yeah. The defamation laws that you're talking about haven't been around forever, and I'm just wondering, do you think if Julian Assange were here working as a journalist now that he'd be in a similar position to you, just facing threats of defamation continuously? Oh, no, absolutely. Well, no doubt. I mean, his stories yeah. were so big that they just shut... That, that he's next gen, next, next gen sort of level to what I am and other people. The, the stuff that he was exposing, cl clearly it's beyond defamation. But in the US, they don't have defamation laws. You have to prove that the journalist is in malicious pursuit before you can sue them. 
Uh, and I know that we have some cases where truth has been used as a successful defence here in Australia. But let's go to some questions from the audience. And we have to remind you to use the microphone as it's being recorded. The lights are blinding, it's true. I can't really see. Yeah. Jenny. Okay. Jenny. Which uh, well, look, uh, no, look, <laughs> there's a person there with no. the microphone, yeah. Oh, you can see John. No, yeah, I, yeah. I was just going to... My name's Roy Drew. I'm also from the Northern Rivers. I was just going to... Um, when you're talking about the, uh, the whole uh, social media being available, I was just wondering what we thought about the pressure to self-censor and what do you make of the cancel culture, for example? Thanks. Oh, self-censorship's huge. Absolutely huge. You can see it every day on the ABC. I know plenty of ABC journalists, plenty of friends that are there over the years past and present, they self-censor daily. The problem with the ABC too isn't just defamation, it's they've got this internal complaints procedure because they're a government agency, or effectively a government corporation, where the PR and lobby groups and lawyers and so on, they know that they can tie them up in red tape. Look what happened to Emma Alberici with the criticisms of Qantas and so on. If you make you know, one little mistake, or even if you don't make a mistake and there's some grey area, they can c complain, take it to the press council, that ties up management time, and so they get gun shy. And that's the problem with the public broadcasters. I'm a huge supporter, but also a critic, because they do self-censor a lot, because they just don't want to get bullied by powerful vested interests. It's a, it is a real problem. It's the editors and producers' judgement. How far can we go? You speak to the Four Corners people, it's always... A lot of stuff gets left on the cutting room floor. Jenny? Michael, my name is Jenny Lewington. John Lyons fed us information. Thanks, Jenny, for the question. I could just, I, di I just didn't get the, the middle bit of it there. The, 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 could you? Um, it was John Lyons made this statement on the ABC at the beginning of the year yeah. that Julian Assange would be released within two months. And that's what Jenny's question is. Oh, I, I missed How the John Lyons so bit. Yeah, well, John's actually an old friend of mine. I like John, he's a great. He's a great journalist. He would be subject to a lot of self-censorship. Mm. He goes pretty hard. I'm sorry, Jenny, I'm just not au fait with... I couldn't speak publicly about that because I'm just not acquainted with the, the facts of it. I assume that it was a... He would have been misled by a source or there might have been something... I'm sure he wouldn't have reported something that wasn't true or that he didn't feel to be true. So, you know, he may well have... There may well have been... I'd just be, it'd be idle speculation, but probably there was some intention somewhere to do the right thing and end this torture of Julian Assange. But and John would have reported on that with a background source, an off the record source, uh, which ended up being wrong because there was a political backflip or something, probably something along those lines. But he's a good journalist, he wouldn't have just made it up. Hmm. One more question, then we'll have to start, John. Oh, well, I think everyone heard that. One more question. Down the front here? Yeah, yeah. Make sure you've got the microphone. Hello, beep boop, beep boop. Yeah, yep, is that yes. working now? Yeah. So, my question is um, maybe for both of you, yep. you know, especially re relating to citizen journalism. How do we incentivize the right conditions to create courage and virtue amongst our journalism? Because it feels like there's a culture of almost journalism being this status pursuit or something rather than um, for anything noble like truth or virtue or um, you know, values. So, so what can we do to incentivize that culture? Um, well... You can get a T-shirt like this, which says, <laughs> which says, uh, 
courage is contagious. And that's the thing about Julian's case. Like, they're hoping fear is contagious, which it is too. And so they're just trying to make every journalist in the world frightened by um, persecuting Julian to this absurd and ludicrous level. And I think um, you've just got to think, you know, I think what Julian said is courage is, cor is courageous. Oh, courage is contagious. And um, that's why I'm wearing this T-shirt as I get up here and talk. <laughs> Question on culture. How do you, you? We sit here and talk all night about culture, but the culture has changed, and I know that from being in the corporate media and now being on my own. The corporations are closer uh, to the the executives are running it. The, the quality of the management isn't. They're not as independent. They're not as smart as they used to be. The the editors in chief of the newspapers and so on. They're on KPIs, key performance indicators. They get actually rewarded for cutting. You know, when they came after me, I said to the guy, the, the Herald editor, and I said, mate, so tell me, you want a KPI on, you want a KPI for cost cutting? In other words, do you make money personally from sacking me? And he just, ultimately, he wasn't such a bad guy, this guy, was just, he, was a, he was a greasy pole climber. So he admitted to me, <laughs> he said, yes, I do. I have got a performance indicator based on cutting costs of my own stuff. This is the problem. Everything's been corporatised, so the culture has changed. It's been, been a corporate culture, but how do you marry, marry a corporate culture with a culture where you're meant to be acting in the public interest, not the interest of the shareholders of your company by being nice to Coca-Cola, Amatol, Qantas and Harvey Norman? Like, the, there's not very rigorous reporting of good old Harvey Norman going on out there in, in corporate media land, but the culture has changed, and that's not going to come back. In, in mainstream. It's now being more subsidised by government as well, so it has to come from all of us, from the public, from social media and independent media and, and, and growth. Of course, the government is the problem there, as, as I said before. If, if they ch keep on making bad laws, and, and, and like, look what happened to Jordan Shakes with that sort of his producer being bullied by the AFP because John Barillaro saw them. I mean, this kind of thing. I mean, and that does scare people. And there is timidity in the culture now, increasing timidity. But people want to keep their jobs. They've got a cost of living crisis. They don't want to have to come home to their, their, their partner and say, I've been sacked because I told the truth. Yeah, we're going to welcome our final speaker for today to the stage soon. But before we do that, just staying on that topic, I just wanted to put to both of you that announcement towards the end of last year of an open letter to US President Joe Biden by the, um, he the he head editors, uh, New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, De Spiegel and uh, El... Pays, I think I've got that right. Pays. Yeah. <laughs> Pays. <laughs> um, so th that open letter to US uh, President Joe Biden is calling for an end to the persecution of Julian Assange. I know there are differing opinions as to the motivation for the letter. Do you, Michael West, see that as an encouraging change in the culture in media? And uh, Dr. John Jiggins, is that an example of courage that has gone contagious? Uh, well, I'm answering first. Um, yeah, in many ways, I, when that uh, John Lyons um, quite, um, you know, prophecy that Julian would be released in two months, I believed it um, because I, he wouldn't do that unless he had a really good source and the source was said to be someone in the government. Uh, went. Uh, so I thought Joe, Joe Biden could use that to sort of um, do that and sort of use that letter he'd got from the um, five newspapers to portray himself as a noble defender of free speech. Um, so I thought it was quite possible. It didn't happen. I noticed, though, that when a, um, a US journalist got um, 
arrested in Russia, Joe Biden actually said, journalism is not a crime. Michael West? Oh, I can't really did you to wanna, You didn't want to add to that one? Do you, you, what did you make of the letter, the open letter? You just get the feeling there's so much going on behind the scenes in various power negotiations that, you know, I, I mean, I, I've got, we've got Rex Patrick writing for us now, and I loved all the lawyers talking about secrecy and so on before, because Rex has now been doing stories, FOIs, to find out why the secret is being made a secret. Mm. He's, really doing, he's doing investigations into cover-ups about cover-ups. So it's got to the ridiculous phase. And I think look, everyone knows, even, even the Hawks, they've got to know, you can't let this bloke die in jail. It's, he will then be a martyr. And he's being tortured. Everyone sort of understands that. It's, it's a really terrible situation. And... Uh, <sighs> It is a terrible situation, and this terrible situation is also a very human situation. It's a real situation affecting a real-life person who has family, um, that, who love him and support him. He has children. His father is here today, John Shipton. John Shipton is going to take to the stage now. He's been giving speeches for a long time all around the world. He's become quite the master, I must say. Last time he was down in Mullumbimby... I think everybody was hanging on his every word. We even heard some poetry. So if we're very lucky, given it's the State Library of Queensland, it's a good place for poetry, John Shipton. Would you like to come up to the stage now? Thanks for the, the, ooh, the warm welcome. Um, David had a little bit of trouble with his gadget. Um, just on that last question, uh, we had, uh, Gabriel and I had an interview with, uh, I won't say his name, but a writer for the Der Spiegel, and they asked me questions about the press, and uh, I, I just said that the press fulfills a requirement of government to address certain areas. So, for example, the Guardian addresses the people on the left, the Telegraph on the right, and so on, to institute government policy because you can't institute policy unless you've got a standing army. They use the press. That's what it's for. So we, uh, I said that to this fella, and he was a bit offended. <laughs> he was a bit offended, and he, Gabriel said, "Oh, you know, you people haven't done very much, and you profited immensely." So the conclusion of the conversation was that he would contact the publishers and editors of those five legacy media giants and put together a letter, and which was done, you know. That's the background. Um, and that was uh, therefore released. It was appropriate that these people, you know, show some support for Julian as a publisher, because in the case of uh, the New York Times, the publisher signed the letter, not the journalist, nor the editor, the publisher. And he realises that his prestige stature depends upon some sort of independence from government or perceived independence from government. And then they'll pull his fingernails out if he doesn't do what the government requires. Prestige and stature and money protect him. I'm sorry to say so. In the case of Michael West, 
review, we were speaking just before the event started. Now, in the, in the Twitter files, and the latest one was today, published by Matt Taibbi, he demonstrates clearly that the FBI, the CDC, NIH, National Institute of Health, WHO, CIA, all of them, including individual senators and, and congressmen, in particular Schiff, Adam Schiff, who is the head of the Intelligence Committee of the Congress, had contact with Twitter over removal of this and, and uh, this, that and the other, you know. In other words, I can say conclusively to you that the First Amendment no longer exists. It's categorical in its statement that the government will make no laws interfering with the free press, constraining conversation. Also free assembly, and also religion. It's categorical, but no longer exists. The government, FBI, all of those institutions of state, CDC, NIH, CIA, all of them constrained the conversation on Twitter for one reason or another. The First Amendment is one of ten that constitute the Bill of Rights. One of the, I forget which one, says that you need a, a trial with your peers. You have to face your accusers. Anwar Aliki, an American citizen, was droned to death in Yemen. His son, 14, another American citizen, was droned to death. So the, the, the great glory of the American Constitution no longer exists as a constraint upon government action. It's pretty fierce, huh? It no longer exists as a constraint upon government action. We just spent, you know, I think we went to 46 cities in 50 days touring with, um, with uh, Ithaca. And then the Q&As after, really interesting, because the people of the United States, born as babies, breathe in and out the First Amendment. It is imbued in their cultural understanding of their nation that they have this phenomenal golden element in their constitution. It's gone. The Bill of Rights, they still believe in the Bill of Rights. Other commentators say that the American populace is insouciant careless. But take upon yourself the full horror of being unable to trust your government in anything it does. It'll just act in its own perceived interest. Power plays, Bismarck called them. You see them in the destruction of nation after nation after nation. The horror of it, 38 million refugees in the Middle East in 20 years. Refugee, what is a refugee? It's a mum and a dad and family looking for some safety after their community has been blown to bits. Gideon Polya, a researcher professor in Melbourne, I, I think Melbourne University, Gideon. He researches excess deaths 
It's a technique, you know, that medical people use to see if there's a pandemic and what's its effect and so on. It's fully explored as a technique and fully understood. Estimates in 21 years, six million souls have perished in the United States' attack on Iraq, Libya. Libya, God's sake, Libya. Shown on TV the death of... I've got a blank on his name now because it's upsetting. Gaddafi. His death was from a bayonet shoved up his anus as they dragged him along. Her reply is a paraphrase of Julius Caesar in Shakespeare. As you remember, the Senate complained that his reports are too long. So he said, well, Vini Vidi Vicky, I came, I saw I conquered. That person, Hillary Clinton, staggering, isn't it? She laughed and said, we saw, we came, he died. You know, it's really important, these things. Julian Assange is emblematic, an emblem of the collapse of the glories of the late 20th century. It took 10,000 years for an understanding and a catastrophe of the death of 60 million, 80, million, 80 million people in the Second World War and the destruction of country after country after country. Atom bombs dropped on, I mean, the full horror of it all. We understood that something would have to be done. And so the people of the world emanated the desire for a United Nations wherein states would relate to each other through a body of laws and pursue their interests within the constraints and overseen by the United Nations Security Council. Gone. Rubbished. Trashed. The United Nations Rapporteur on Torture, Professor Nils Melzer, made a report 2019, mid-2019, 26 pages long, that Julian Assange was a victim of torture. He went to the jail with two doctors who understand these things and they wrote their report and sent it to the United King Kingdom government and the Swedish government, which they both ignored it, derided it. Actually, the United Kingdom government, I understand, didn't even reply. The Swedish government replied. The United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. They investigated to whether Julian was being arbitrarily detained, came to the conclusion that he was, and published in February 2018, the detail of a comprehensive determination that Julian was arbitrarily detained and should be allowed free and paid compensation by Sweden and the United Kingdom. derided, derision, due process that holds us together. So we, in this system, have it that the defence must be as equally armed as the prosecution so that we can make a fair judgement on what's before us. Julian Assange. Lord Phillips, 2011, in the extradition case brought by the Swedish government, made his determination. I think, as I remember, there were two 
uh, that didn't agree with Phillips's judgment, two that did, and Phillips was the deciding factor. He's retired now, I think he's 83. I wanted to ring him up, but I thought I might be rude. Lord Phillips's judgment. He took it. So in the case was that they argued that a judicial officer, not a prosecutor, had to issue the WEA, the warrant, a judicial officer. Lord Phillips took the French translation as the foundation of his judgment and said that Julian can be extradited. Nothing to do. I mean, the Parliament never saw the French translation when it's made its decision on the treaty and on the, on the WEA arrest warrant. Parliament didn't see the French translation. I mean, one after the other, a list so long. The other day, I saw uh, Jennifer interviewed, and she, they asked her, you know, about due process. But she said, oh, the list's too long. It is long. What about irregularities? The Swedish Prosecuting Authority and the Crown Prosecuting Service, officers of government, Australian, you know, politicians or, or bureaucrats, came and said, Julian can leave any time he likes. You know, it's up to him. He's there because he wants to be. The Crown Prosecuting Service and the Swedish Prosecuting Authority, the FOI as reveal it, conspired together to keep Julian in the embassy for seven and a half years until the circumstances evolved to the extent that they could drag him out. That's the truth. Where are you going to hear that? Grim. But there's more. <laughs> what are the elements of psychological torture? Intimidation, isolation, arbitrariness, humiliation, mobbing, scurrilous slander. 14 years of it. Frickin' hell. Is there no decency anywhere, you know? When you commit a crime, you know, abridge human rights. I mean, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, who was the president of the uh, General Assembly in 1948? Herbert V. Evert. Herbert V. Evert and Eleanor Roosevelt put the Universal Declaration of Human Rights together under their aegis, and it was passed by the... the, the uh, General Assembly, and subsequently, every, you know, every European nation has embraced the uh, human rights declarations in their, in their national legislature. All of them. England. The very authors of these elements, these civilizational, magnificent elements that we brought that emanated out of us a bridge. They dumped them. I was with Lopez Obrador for an hour the other day, a very wise, warm man who had a lot of responsibility. He said that uh, states, when I brought up the UN in the conversation, he said that sta well, I didn't have enough time to develop my argument, but he immediately interrupted, he said that states follow their interests. Okay. Is it in their interests for all against all? No. What is the fundamental element of being a human being? 
cooperation. Otherwise, it's all against all in a bloodbath. We cooperate together. That is the element of us. And having means and mechanism whereby we can relate. The, the means is the laws brought into being in the United Nations. That's the means. It also is a measure to see how far you go from that. So when people say, oh, the United Nations, it failed, you know, it doesn't do this or that and the other, it remains as a measure. It's always there as a measure. Now, I guess I can start to finish now. The Council of Europe, they made a declaration that Julian Assange is a protected journalist and must be freed. The United Nations High Commission have made the same declaration, or similar, sorry, similar declaration. Australia made a declaration. Obrador, Andreas, Mig Andreas Miguel Lopez, Lopez Obrador, very fine man, has made a declaration twice and spent an hour with us. Lula, president of of Brazil, Fernandez, president of Argentina, Beletic, president of Chile, Petro, president of Colombia, have all made the same or similar declarations that Julian is a publisher, journalist, and must be freed. It echoes around the world of the Greek parliament of 300 people, 90 here in the Assange group. The Australian Parliament, 25%. Millions of people around the world. Somebody said, how much money have we spent? Well, with Julian about a year ago, uh, 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 we estimated that to get him freed will cost 40 million. I think we've probably spent 20 million today. $20 million. I'm a pensioner. I get $511 a week. Yet we've spent $20 million. Where does that money come from? It emanates from you. This matter will only be solved from the bottom up. There's no interest in the institutions of state in going against the United States. No. But the beautiful thing in parliamentary government happened with the Assange case, the really beautiful thing, is that the people took their concerns to parliamentarians. The parliamentarians have taken those concerns into parliament. And the majesty, the sovereign majesty of parliament has brought it to the note, notice of the executive. It's a model for every other social concern to use that model, to go to the people. people there's a friend here who's in PR and he says that we should do more PR. It's PR, you translate that to money. So you go money, media, politics. Well, we're not in that. Like Obrador, like Lula, who I met three times in Europe. <laughs> he was, you know, got out of jail and he was doing the rounds. He was on the road. Bumped into him in uh, Geneva and then later in Paris and he'd been to Berlin, uh, Strasbourg, and then spoke to the parliament in Strasbourg, then to Brussels, then to... I met him in Paris and then he was on his way to to uh, Madrid. They go on the road. It's from people. So we put here, and the, you know, there's lots of people here I've met many times on the road. We go on the road. We go to people and then media, because regional media is interested. 
they're not cosmopolitans. They still retain their health. If you know, I don't mean any insult to cosmopolitans, but in the in the that they have, uh, you know, a hunger for news of their own making. You know, so we go there, and then we end up with uh, some political circumstance. Eighty-eight percent of the Australian population want Julian brought home. I think I've, I've really come. I've said enough. I just wanted to. There's something interesting here in the beginning, which I'll close with. The world revolves around creators of new values, revolves invisibly. But the people and fame revolve around actors. Far from the marketplace and from fame happens all, emerges all that is great. Far from the marketplace, the inventors of new values have always dwelt. And that's the truth. We went to, I think we did five tours in New South Wales. And, uh, sorry, five tours of the East Coast. And a couple over in Western Australia and a good few in Adelaide. And so it grew and grew and grew. And it became a worldwide phenomenon. You might bring to mind Kev Carmody's beautiful song, From Little Things, Big Things Grow. Thank you. Would you like to sit down for the question from the audience? I've got to pass around uh, a couple of jars for... Uh, Can we do it at the same time as the Q&A for John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. All right, that's what we want to do. But we should draw the raffle because... Right. Uh, do you want to draw? We're going to, you will have an opportunity to ask some questions of John Shipton. So while we do this uh, raffle, has anyone, is anyone wanting to buy tickets now before we... Last, last chance? No no, no? no, that's it? That's it? Okay. All right, all right. All right. Is, is John going to be the one to draw out the, no, the number? It seems appropriate. John. Yeah, John Shipton, I meant, sorry. <laughs> yeah, have a think about your questions. And please, when you ask a question, make sure you've got the mic and please try to be succinct. So just get to the question as quickly as you can to ensure that uh, we have as much time as possible to hear the questions. I haven't got my glasses on, so you're going to have to handle that. Green C022. Ah, okay. Right. okay. Well done. Now, this one here? Yep. At the same time, I'm going to uh, just pass around a few uh, places for don donations. So um, I'll, uh, I guess, start. Yeah, and you can go up to there, and there's 4,000 somewhere up the back. And uh, is this the second? No, that was the... I oh, don't know. No. I need another ticket. Has John Shipton... Because there's a second prize. A second prize. Yeah, a T-shirt. The cool T-shirt that you're wearing. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Don't worry. Jenny's explained it. There's definitely oh, another prize. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny says there is... A Oh, I'm going to try it. Damn it. <laughs> okay, and I might, um, let's, have we got the microphones? Because we'll get the first questioner ready. Right. Yeah, up the back is going to be the first question. Is that right? Is that what's happening? Yeah, I see your hand up there. We've got a woman up the back who'd like to ask a question. So if we could have the microphone taken to her. She's standing with a hand raised in the air, wearing a, looks like a pretty awesome T-shirt. <laughs> okay, now the winner of, the, of a T-shirt here. Thank you, oh, Judith, Blue B 17 
That's you? I don't have the T-shirt here right now, but Jenny is here and she can probably tell you where to collect your T-shirt from. It's probably going to be just around the corner. All right, so up the back, wearing a great T-shirt. Question for John Shipton. Hear me? Yes. John, you had a figure there for how much it's been costing for the legal campaign, et cetera, which is a phenomenal amount. Has anyone done a calculation as to what the three-letter agencies and the US government has spent on persecuting Julian? Because I reckon it must be in the hundreds of millions. Uh, no, we haven't done, you know, anything like that to just sort of, we just, uh, you know, take the, what flows towards us uh, and handle that the best we can. Um, the resources of the United States, of course, are immense, you know, and uh, they are unstinting in their application, except for the fact that they're in a lot of trouble now uh, with their decision to uh, attempt to destroy Russia and uh, constrain China. So I guess uh, that opens up a, an, an opportunity for us uh, because I feel certain, I feel rather, not certain, I feel that uh, They've got enough on their plate and they probably want to get rid of this Assange uh, persecution in the, in the quietest and most decent way possible. Thank you. Okay. All right. We've got uh, a woman down the front here who'd like to ask a question. I'm going to queue up two. I think that makes it a bit easier. So after, after we've had this question, there's also a woman I can see up t towards the back there in the middle. So those two. And um, I'll just remind, and I can see more hands up, so great. Make sure you get to the question, not too much of a story or a comment before the question, please. And I forgot to mention, we heard for, uh, Rory Drew ask a question before. He is uh, a big campaigner for the freedom of Julian Assange. He's also on the Northern Rivers where I'm living. And he mentioned to me that there were two petitions here today so I hope people have been signed, have signed those. And if you haven't signed them, Roy, if you're around, do you want, where are you? Okay, Roy's over here. So if you have not had a chance to sign the petitions and you can't get to sign the petition, you could go see Roy and he'd let you know um, they'll be online. Let's hear that next question down here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, rather than, other than writing our letters to Canberra, London and Washington, what else is there we can do? Uh, okay. um, uh, you, you know, a good thing is to let, let the, your local member know your feelings. I mean, they only can measure what your concerns are through contact with you. So you ring them up and say, you know, this thing is just pretty wretched and uh, I insist that, well, probably insists a bit strong, but uh, it would be really advisable if you want to continue to have my support uh, to, to bring it to an end. And, you know, the vulnerability of Parliament is in the individuals, they can be, as we see, suborned. And um, another thing is that, say, if you take the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as an example, which has within it the ASIS, uh, the Australian Secret Intelligence Services, um, and the uh, Department of Trade and the Diplomatic Corps. And the Diplomatic Corps att att attracts the best and the brightest. The ASIS gives them access to private information from Five Eyes and their own work so that they have a certain amount of hubris and they, uh, you have the occasion now where a talented member like uh, Penny Wong uh, becomes the minister 
and you have DFAT, well, it's 5,300 employees with a few billion in, in, uh, in, in its budget, it's a little strong to expect uh, Penny to rule that place the way we are taught that things are done, you know. Institutions of state have their own interests, their own ideology. Um, so it's best that the pulse arises for change, arises from the, the uh, individual members and from the public, the pulse. They're, they're very... Con Otherwise, you know, they wouldn't bother their heads with uh, having all of these newspapers report their stuff the way they wanted, uh, that Michael described to us if they didn't feel it necessary to amalgamate us in their, in, to support their policies. So that is their vulnerability. They want our support. Well, okay, they can have it the, uh, under, the circum under certain circumstances. One of those circumstances is decency. The other circumstance is moral integrity. The other one is stop fibbing to us. We're not dummies. You've got your microphone up the back there and we'll just queue up uh, the next person to ask a question. There was someone down here. Yeah, this gentleman here. If we could get him the mic for the next question after this one. Yeah, my question... My question's um, just in regards to the messaging that's sent by some arbitrary decisions made, particularly in relation to Bradley Manning being pardoned, uh, given he was the original source of the, um, the files to Julian. Um, how does that sit with, with everybody? What was that? Sorry? Sorry? Referring to Chelsea Manning, do you want me to ask him to repeat the question? Yeah, yes, please. Sorry, sir, do you mind repeating the question? Yeah, it was just about um, uh, Chelsea Manning now uh, being, uh, I, I thought it was originally pardoned by Barack Obama, but it was apparently commuted. Either way, um, it, it sends a message that there is some arbitrariness in regards to uh, the US government in its decision and what messages it sends to those who are prepared to leak, that how, how is it that one person can be pardoned and another person face 175 years? Oh, uh, you know, President Obama is uh, a talented individual, always smiling, and, uh, um, you know, he did the Tuesday morning kill list, but, uh, you know, he... Nobody knows about that. Um, he also ordered the destruction of Anwar Aliki and his son, but few know about that. Um, I think uh, the mm, sympathy and accolades he got from commuting Chelsea Manning's uh, uh, was, I mean, yeah. I think probably you've got a bit of sympathy for it. I'd just like to make a point too about Chelsea Manning that, you know, in the French um, mythology, Joan of Arc stands very high. And I, in the, uh, in the American mythology, maybe Chelsea will eventually take that sort of position in their mythology. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty brave lass, you know. Okay, a, que a, question a question down here, and we'll queue up someone else. Uh, is there another hand in the air anywhere? Up the very, very back will be the next question after this one. Thank you, sir. Um, it, was, it was only uh, a week or so ago that the editor-in-chief of RT News proposed a, a prisoner swap of three um, prisoners held by the Russians for 
Julian Assange. Um, I think uh, Gershwich was in the news at the time and that prompted the, the suggestion um, of the prisoner swap. Uh, what's, do you place any store in that proposal? No, uh, no, I don't know why RT's floating that, uh, probably for their own reasons, you know, it's quite sort of newsworthy and it gets people to, to uh, attention. But that's, that's all I could speculate. I have had no indication uh, other than what, what I read on RT myself, you know. Just one, one more point, which is really nice, is that the genius of a people ar arises from within the mass, from within us, and it arises or ascends from us. And that's really important to keep in mind. Also, Ju Ju Louis Borges, who, uh, I read a translation of his on the plane, said that the great uh, burden is idiocy. Now, when they constrain what we can learn and understand and they bring uh, false news or misinformation or actually they constantly change the information so that it makes sense today but it doesn't make sense yesterday and all that sort of thing. It undermines the capacity of government to draw upon the people and they're left in their own hubris as that they, only they understand when in fact the quality of the government and its constituent parts arises from within us. So constraining the information and our education is a bloody dead end. And it's a lack of understanding when parliamentarians treat us in a childlike fashion and attempt to infantile our understanding. It's ridiculous and it will come back to bite them because we'll become apathetic and indifferent and insouciant, careless. So that's a lesson that we must insist that government understands, you know, that the genius of Australia arises from within us. Herbert V. Everett, 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Gough Whitlam, Conventions of Asylum, 1973, one of the most vital aspects of the United Nations legislation. Many others. Barry Humphreys died the other day. It arose from within our hearts and culture. It didn't come down from the top. It percolates upwards and ever shall be so. Thank you. We have a, we have a question up the back and then over here, I see it. Um, someone. Oh, hang on. Did you, uh, was there someone else you wanted to ask a question yeah. because I know that you asked, got to ask Do one I before? I know up the back, yeah, I'm queuing up the next one. Sorry, should have explained. Over here Someone. will be the one after. Up the back first. Uh, I'd like to ask John if you've spoken to Julian since he's had a visit from Stephen Smith. <laughs> yes, yeah. And yeah. what did he tell you? <laughs> oh, yeah, yes, I, I spoke uh, while we were in America the other day. I haven't since we've been travelling back to Australia. Um, you know, he was uh, quite... Chuffed, uh, uh, we, we we refer to uh, because they're always listening to our f phone calls. You know, we we refer to uh, uh, Stephen as the Ambo, you know, <laughs> the ambassador. You know, I mean, just got to make it somewhat difficult for them because they listen. And who's the Ambo? What does he mean by the? Yeah. Yeah, what did he say? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, 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 I, I, I probably can't repeat uh, Julian's comments, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe 
Maybe it'll come out on WikiLeaks. <laughs> okay, we had a question down here and then um, we've still got time for some more. So, and then over here. Hi. Hello. 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 Uh, my name is Philip Adams. I'm the uh, petitioner. Of the uh, Philip. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have a... Certainly, um, the Prime Minister, he, he signed the petition on his first day in office uh, before he flew to um, Japan to meet Biden. Um, it's been tabled in both Houses of Parliament. It has a uh, reference number with the International Criminal Court in order for us to lodge evidence in the future towards um, allegedly... Uh, crimes Against Humanity for public officers in Australia, Ecuador, Britain and Sweden. My question is, there is a, uh, a quad meeting in Australia where Biden is, uh, has been invited by Albanese at the end of May, around start of June time frame. Uh, does anyone know exactly what date? is scheduled to occur and also we've been hearing a lot of uh, what has what is being dished out from the top down and we also hear that pressure and advancements happen from the bottom up well we also have to look at which where we have um, positive progressions in this particular campaign and um, the petition is certainly one aspect where we have gained some, nailed some advancements, particularly with the signature of uh, Anthony Albanese under the petition, which bound him to make senior ministerial representations to his counterpart. I also note that uh, the wording that they're using is very similar to what the petition... Um, laid on the designates when it was submitted to him. I think there is an opportunity coming up for the campaign to look progressively from the bottom up when uh, Biden will arrive in Australia. Because here we have a situation where the Prime Minister of Australia has not only made representations but physically signed on the campaign petition as reported by the ABC, not didn't come from me, there's only three parties that know who signed. One is the petitioner, the other one is change and they're bound by privacy. The other one must be the person that signed it. So the source of, the, of that information must have come from the source, the, the signature themselves. We have a significant opportunity with Biden coming out here that we can uh, raise some questions as to the treating of the Prime Minister with impunity, with the fact that this has not, he has not been released in two months, as John Ryan of the ABC so called reported. Uh, so, first question when is he arriving? And secondly, start thinking within our own selves what we can do to um, lay a question on President Biden as we are coming into our shores. Um, and with our signatory, because all the negative aspects of Albanese, I don't think it's negative. I think he's signed on, and I think he's now one of us. We just need to help elevate him to make representations. So I think we need to look at when Biden is scheduled to come here and start action on that front. You know Does anybody you know? know John? Oh. What is it? Thank you. Did you want to respond? Um, no. Lydia, um, it's time for us to finish, but before we finish, it's really important that I remind you that tomorrow is May Day in Brisbane, and John Tipton is going to be marching with the MEAA and his supporters. <laughs> And we want as many of you to be there as possible. So just to remind you of that, the way the um, May Day March 
occurs is around about uh, 9.30, people start to gather at the corner of Wharf Street and Turbot Street. Um, it's a big march and it'll stretch back a kilometre. It might be difficult to find us um, because it's a long walk along there. And the MEAA, which is the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, which is Julian's union, um, it's quite small, though we hope it will, it'll be really big this year with people um, turning up. We've got Lots of flags and lots of banners, so we should be really colourful. And it's the Labor Party's main, you know, it's the Labor Party's big um, statement, I guess, or the trade union's big statement in Brisbane, and the trade unions have an enormous effect on the Labor Party. So it's really important, seeing the Labor Party is now in power, that we um, get as big as a crowd together for May Day, so we're naturally inviting you all to come along, march with John Shipton and um, send a message to the Labor Party of the support for Julian Assange. Uh, we've got one last announcement from Jenny oh, here. And, and la last comment, I've just heard Albanese will actually be there tomorrow. So, yeah, really important to turn up. John, is well, there time for just a one last question from this woman here? Yep. yep. Okay. John? John, just, just down here, there was a woman who was promised that she'd get asked a question. Is that okay? And then I think Jenny has an announcement too. Um, look, I was just going to ask, um, considering that 2001, when the terrorist 9-11 event occurred, that seemed to catapult the world uh, governed by America into this loss of freedoms. It was the um, beginning of it all. Considering now that in 2007, the Zogby poll of the public in America showed that 51% of the American population wanted a reinvestigation of 9-11, and they never did another poll again. And recently, the architects and engineers I think about 80,000 of them have proven that WTC7 did not collapse as a result of any plane debris. Would that be an important element in the future uh, to discuss? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, before people go, hey, hang wait, on. Wait, wait. John Shifton is going to answer the question and then there's an announcement. Yeah, of course. Uh, you, you know, um, after Julian's out, all of these contentious and difficult things can be taken on. However, until then, let's get him home and yeah, with the kids. <laughs> uh, uh, one last message, one large message from Jenny about what you can do yourself. Meet Your MP program for Assange has garnered an overwhelming response with over 400 sign-ups. Our community is growing stronger every day. If you haven't already, we urge you to send an email to your MP requesting a meeting or calling their office. We have participants at various stages of the program and we encourage you to take action today to secure a meeting date in May 2023. So look on the internet for Meet Your MP program. Cool. That's it. That's it. Thanks, everyone, for coming along today. Uh, don't forget about tomorrow's march. Look up the petitions online and let's see what happens when Joe Biden comes out at, towards the end of May.